On today's episode of the John Campy Show podcast, James Gunn says Peacemaker season one, yeah, like the most successful thing that the DCU ever did. It's not canon to the new DCU. Also, we're going to talk about the world of streaming, and I'm sorry, but how it's about to get a lot more expensive and a lot more inconvenient and irritating. Also, <laughs> Dune 2 has a fantastic second weekend, and Kung Fu Panda 4 has one of the best openings the franchise has ever had. Super Mario 2 is officially announced, and it's got a release date, and Oppenheimer dominated what was, honestly, the best Oscars broadcast in years that and a whole bunch more the john campus show podcast starts right now it really was it really was it was a great Oscar show. well greetings and salutations everybody welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet earth the john campus show podcast coming from right here in our quaint little studio. I am, of course, your host, John Campia, and it is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, our international friends, gather around as we talk about our favorite things in the world, movies, movie news, TV, streaming, all sorts of good stuff, not just giving you our opinions, but giving you some information and context so you guys can form your own well-informed opinions, whether they're the same or even different than ours. Uh, joining me in studio today, I got Ray Ora. Good morning, happy Monday. Jonathan Voiko's here. Happy about Mondays. Get out. <laughs> Writer, director, producer, Robert Meyer Burnett. It's delightful to be here. <laughs> and most importantly, you guys are here. Thank you so much for being here and making this little show a part of your day. Here's how the show's going to go. We're going to start off by talking about those topics that I listed off. And then in the last part of the show, we're going to take your live comments and questions. Uh, unfortunately, we've already turned off the Super Chats because the Super Chats got filled up really, really quick. <laughs> But normally on other days, you can send in a super chat with a thought you have. And as long as it's appropriate to be used on our show, we'll address it on the show. All right, guys. With that all down, let's get things started off with this. You know, uh, surprisingly, the single most successful thing that DC ever had with their DCEU wasn't one of their movies which except for Aquaman and maybe the first Wonder Woman all underperformed to, to some group degree. Uh, some of them made money, but did not live up to the potential of what they were. But Peacemaker, a show that I admittedly thought was a stupid idea. And I admittedly thought looked pretty crappy when they first dropped the first couple of trailers. I admit it. I admit it. It was like maybe the best thing they did other than Man of Steel. And it became like the number one show in the world for while it was running. So it was no real big surprise that when James Gunn and Peter Safran announced the new DCU replacing the old DCEU, that if there was anything they were going to bring over, it was going to be that. But how would Peacemaker fit in and, you know, kind of reconcile what is going to be massive differences between the old universe, the DCEU, and this brand new DCU? Well, apparently the answer was something I didn't think about. Peacemaker season one isn't going to be canon to the new DCU. This comes from the folks at CBR who write the following. Over on threads, James Gunn stated that Peacemaker season one isn't canon to the DC universe. Also telling an inquiring fan that season two, quote unquote, will take place after the events in the upcoming Superman movie. When another fan asked if it was important and meant that the events in Man of, the Man of Steel's newest in, uh, cinematic outing, which is, of course, the new Superman movie, he said, would be having an impact on Peacemaker Season 2. The filmmaker replied, yes. Okay. So uh, let, let's talk about this for a second. This I didn't see this coming, to be honest with you. Because I always said, if you actually look at the events of Peacemaker Season 1, they are pretty divorced from the DCEU as a whole. I said, the only thing you really got a retcon to make it fit in a new DCEU is that little cameo at the end of season one where Aquaman, Flash, and the silhouettes of Superman and Batman show up and the, the, one of the greatest lines in television that year. Fuck you, Barry. That was like one of the greatest lines in television that year. All you really had to do was take that out and you could make an argument that it didn't actually happen in the DCEU, just some DC universe. But what I didn't really think they would do is what James Gunn is saying is just, we're just going to say season one isn't canon to what's going on in the new DCU. To which somebody may reply, well, then why don't you do that for Wonder Woman? 
Why, why don't you do that for Gal Gadot's Wonder Woman? Just say, well, it's not, the old Wonder Woman stuff isn't canon, but we can still bring over. Why not do that for my beloved Henry Cavill? <laughs> Where's Henry? <laughs> Where's Henry right now? Why didn't you do that for Henry Cavill? I mean, all you had to say is that Man of Steel and the, and the movies he was in was not canon to the DCU. I would propose this, is that I think if you're going to start a new universe, Rob, you start as clean of a slate as possible. I agree. Ideally, completely clean slate. But if you're going to bring anything over, the de facto thing that was the most successful thing you did and had audiences going crazy for it, and that would be so easy to retool and refit so it does just fit in the DCU. I Again, I'm all for totally clean slate, but if you're going to just bring one thing over, this seems to be the thing to bring over. What did you think about uh, James Gunn's comments here? Well, here's here's the thing, John. I think that I think that James Gunn's Superman is all about the tone mm. that he's going to strike. You know, if you look at Richard Donner's Superman, the first half an hour of the film, especially the stuff in Smallville, is so iconic. It's so Americana, and you've got that great scene where Glenn Ford tells his son. I know that you are here for a reason. And you hear John Williams' great score. I think James Gunn is going for that kind of tone. And I think when you look at Peacemaker, that the tone of Peacemaker, dude, it's awesome. We love Peacemaker. But the tone of the show, I think, is, and I know nothing. I've not read the script. I don't know anything about James Gunn's Superman or what happens. But I think the tone of Peacemaker is probably diametrically opposed to <laughs> what he's trying to do with his Superman movie. And it's like, if we're creating a new universe, there's probably not a place for the tone of Peacemaker, if that makes any sense. Right. You know what I mean? I, 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 I just think when I, dude, we love Peacemaker. <laughs> Come on, we st we could still probably do the dance right here if we were called to do it. But I just think the tone of the show is different than what he... He has to create something that appeals to everybody. Peacemaker's R-rated. Very R-rated. It's very R-rated. Yeah. You know, when you, when you do it, you got to make it appeal to the world. And you've got to make it appeal to that mythical, beautiful structure that Superman represents. I think to everybody. Not just to America. But I mean, isn't there something to be said to you? Because I think you and I have talked about this before, that an entire cinematic universe does not need to have one uniform tone. No, right? of course not. So like, you can have, like for example, I'm sure we haven't seen Deadpool 3 yet. I'm sure it's going to be totally very different than Winter Soldier. Like, I'm sure it's going to be ex <laughs> extremely different in tone. <laughs> but, right? Like, completely different. So, yes. I mean, maybe this, this would be like right out of the gate a good way for James Gunn to show, like, we are going to have a cohesive cinematic universe, but we're also going to have a wide variety of programming that with different tones and feels and, and levels. But you're right. I mean, the trick is going to be how do you make them then mesh, right? Yeah, and, and the thing is, if Peacemaker was canon, that tethers what Superman... In, 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 I, I Very totally true. agree with yeah. you. You know, right. there, there, it, it, there's something there that they're, people are going to expect. And look... Penguin has its own The Batman universe. Yeah. And this is something it has to be, I think, it has to be fresh. It has to be new. It has to be clean and clear of all baggage because they're doing something new. And if they were, if, if there's some anchor to the past, I don't think they could be as successful doing what they're doing. I agree. So the question is for you guys, what do you think? James Gunn has said, actually, you know, season one of Peacemaker – probably the most successful thing they had in the DCU is not going to be canon here. So it's kind of a clean slate, even for Peacemaker. What do you think about that? What do you think the implications of that are going to be? Whatever you guys think, jump down into the comments section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys, with that down, let's jump into this, shall we? Oh, the world of streaming. <laughs> Remember back when streaming started and we all said, hallelujah. We can cut the cord, get rid of cable, because streaming is going to be so much better and so much cheaper. And then there were some naysayers at the time who said, just you wait. This streaming thing, you guys, you kiddies are getting all excited about, it's going to end up being more convoluted and more expensive than what cable is. And people like me at the time were going, nah, 
you're just being salty because the new thing is here. The age of streaming is here. Turns out those people were right. And we did, we've done it a couple times here where we added up the various streaming propositions out there. And if you do, you are paying now more for your television entertainment than we ever were before with cable. Now, there were benefits that we had, right? No ads. Watch when you want. Subscribe to something, you got access to the whole playground. Like There were advantages. But slowly but surely, we've been seeing those advantages disappear as prices for streaming have continued to go up and up and up and up. And I'm here to deliver an inconvenient truth from the high mountain. It's about to get a lot worse. It's about to get a lot worse. We're going to break down how. Now, I, I want to mention this uh, in the out front because there's a great video on YouTube uh, that was put up in the last week or so by Digital Trends that talks about this very thing. And I highly recommend you go check this out. But some friends of mine and I were talking kind of about this. And then I saw this video and I thought, you know, we should we should talk about this in general because I was just having a discussion about this and how I think the rates are about to go up. But let's jump into the classroom for a second, shall we? And, and let's look at, first of all, where streaming has been, right? For the longest time, we had the, the model, right? We had the, the regular TV model, and then along comes streaming. Fabulous. We all liked it. Netflix got started going. They started digitally delivering their DVDs to you over the internets instead of a physical disc showing up. Then, around 2013, the streamers started to produce their own original content. I remember... And I don't know if we can get me in the shot there, Jonathan, but I, I remember um, when I first saw a billboard for House of Cards and thinking, oh my God, like Netflix is making a show? Like they're yeah. not just going to be showing, they're making a show? And I remember the comment from the head of Netflix at the time saying, we got to become HBO before HBO becomes us. And they were right. So, uh, and then Hulu came along and they, they had one or two things first, but they came out with the, um, uh, I almost called the bridesmaid, uh, not the bridesmaid, Handmaid. the Elizabeth Moss show, Handmaid. Handmaid's Tale, Handmaid's Tale. And then all of a sudden they started making great content. Well, then we went from producers creating their own content and then the pandemic happens and there's this huge growth in streaming that comes as a result. Now, as it turns out though, that huge growth was a little bit of a mirage because while everybody stayed at home and so all these streaming numbers started to explode, the streamer started thinking this was a river of gold that would never stop flowing. And so they started doubling down on how much content they were producing, the expense, the money they were putting into everything, thinking this is a train, this is a party train that is never going to come into station. We're going to ride this thing forever. We're going to make all the money and all that kind of stuff. Well, what started happening was they started realizing that, oh, it does run out. The growth does slow down. And so we started seeing things like ads and ad tiers. And... Even now today, when you look at, you know, uh, not just the ads and the ad tiers, but now not only are the streamers adding tiers of ads, now the actual platforms we use to access those streaming services that have ads have ads themselves. <laughs> I opened up my Chrome, my Google TV Chromecast, right? Now, I'm not in Netflix yet. I'm not in Hulu yet. I'm not in Disney Plus. I'm not on YouTube. I just opened up my, my Google TV Chromecast, right? And what should be at the top, which is normally put a carousel of like big shows and movies you can access right now. No, the first thing I see when I open up is an ad for the new Kia EV9, a fabulous looking car, by the way, <laughs> but it had nothing to do with streaming or chicken tender wraps or something. So now... We've gone from this, you know, utopia, this this wondrous world. Uh, what do we got on screen there? It's we go from this wondrous world of, you know, ad free, get what you want, when you want, all this kind of stuff. To now, there's ads, ad tiers. They're overpricing non ad tiers things to try to, you know, shuffle us into the ad thing. Now the platforms themselves, Roku, Google, Apple TV, they're actually now putting up ads for products they want us to buy. 
And it's just gotten worse and worse and worse. But guys, I'm here to tell you three different ways that just when you think it's gotten as bad as it's going to get, <laughs> and all that we have to worry about is raising monthly prices, I'm here to talk about three other things that are about to really jab us in the ass on top of the increasing prices month to month. So what comes next? Well, here's what's coming next, guys. First up, sign-up fees. I'm telling you, these are coming. Right now, if you want to sign up for Disney+, Plus, they just say, thank you, that'll be $15, $17, $18 a month, whatever their monthly fee is. They just say, thank you, open the door, say, welcome in. Uh, Now you start paying your monthly subscription fee. But I'll tell you what's coming. A one-time $30 sign-up fee. You don't believe me? Look at every other industry. It's coming. And it's also going to be one of their safeguards because what's the biggest enemy to streaming services right now? Churn. People sign up to Disney+, Plus, watch the newest season of Mandalorian, unsubscribe. And then when maybe, uh, I don't know, the Acolyte comes out, okay, we'll sign back up. And then as soon as the Acolyte's done, unsubscribe. That's their number one thing. So a sign-up fee to get them a little extra cheddar of people coming in the door and as a safeguard to protect them from people unsubscribing to just sign up again in a month or two. And if they do do that, we're going to ding you again for that sign-up fee. Isn't it great? Now, they might be charitable and say, you know what? If you're a first-timer signing up, we waive the subs- we re- waive the sign-up fee. We waive the sign-up fee if you're a first-time subscriber. But otherwise, they're going to charge you 30 bucks to sign up and then 15 bucks for your first month, and away you go. And you can say, they'll never do that. Oh, I, I, I guarantee you. I, I'm not saying it's going to be this year. Might not even be before Superman. But 2026, 2027, I guarantee you that's coming. Hmm. That, my friends, is coming. And it's not the only thing that's coming. The next thing that's coming is... Something that's a very, very weird kind of model. Here it is. Credits. See, right now, when you sign up for a streaming service, it's an open playground. Welcome to Netflix. Come on in. Our world is yours. Everything the light touches, you can come in and watch for your little monthly fee. Isn't that great? Well, that ain't going to last. Because the credit system is coming. What's the credit system? Uh, Jonathan brought up a good point to me a little bit earlier, but here's an example of a credit system. Uh, Audible. I love Audible, by the way. Huge Audible fan. I love it. It's a little service on Amazon where you sign up, you get a certain number of credits for your monthly thing, then you can use your credits to buy digital books. But you can run out of credits. And then when you do run out of credits, they go, no worry. For 36 bucks, you can buy three more credits. Uh, uh, digital AI art right now. Uh, it's pretty big with that, right? You go and sign up for a monthly fee, but you get like 300 credits and every image you generate might cost 20 credits. A, a, a higher 4K res image might cost 30 credits. And this is happening on a lot of other types of online services right now. Here's what's going to happen. And we're, I'm not trying to pick on Netflix. I'm just using them as the example, okay? Right now, Netflix, you pay your 15 bucks a month, 20 bucks a month, come on in, the world is yours, whatever the light touches. Majuenia, right? It's all yours. It's all good. <laughs> but here's what's happening. What's going to happen is that Netflix at some point is going to say, hey, for your monthly sign-up, you get 300 credits. You want to watch a 30-minute episode of a sitcom? That's just one credit. You want to watch an, ep- an hour-long episode of a drama? That's two credits. You want to watch a movie? That's four credits. And 300 credits is plenty, everybody. It's Mm -hmm. plenty. That's what they're going to tell you. I say, oh, you ran out of credits and it's only the 23rd? You still got another week and you still want to use Netflix? No worry. For an extra 10 bucks, you can buy 75 extra credits. And you may say, nah, they'll never do that. Look at what's happening online with all other online services right now. I, I could see that happening with like new releases. Like, let's say there's a movie in theater and someone gets the rights, like a streaming service. I could see having a credit system for that. Or if you want to watch Squid Game season two within the uh, in the its first two weeks, first month, pay those extra credits. But if not, then you can watch it after. But but for every single thing they have on there, if they're going to do it. And here's what they're going to do. To your oh, point. Yeah. To your point. Like two credits for an hour long drama. Oh, but if it's 
Squid Game Season 2, well, in its first two weeks of being out, that's five credits to watch an episode of that because it's a brand new thing. It's a brand new thing. So credits, Don't my forget friend. credits with ads or credits without ads. Oh, it'll be with ads, too. They'll yeah. figure out a way to... Listen, but, but if you want to use more credits without yeah, ads... you can pay even more credit yeah, yeah, yeah. to get it without ads. And then here's... I just want to make sure we're being fair. Do you get fair. a discount? I want to make sure ads. we're being fair with credit. You're going to start needing an economics degree to figure out how your streaming service is going to work. And then there's going to be this. On top of credits and all that kind of stuff, premium content costs. Yeah. And if uh, maybe I didn't, shouldn't misspell premium. So to, to kind of raise points saying, you know, maybe then when like a Hunger Game or a, a Squid Game season two comes out, maybe they charge you more credits or blah, 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 blah. Mm. I think it might even go one step beyond that. I think we're going to get to a point where it's going to be something like, hey, the new Martin Scorsese, Leonardo DiCaprio movie, we're debuting on Apple TV Plus. We know you're already a member and you got to be a member, but it's also going to be five more bucks. Five bucks to watch this. At least for the first two months that it's out. And let's bring up this list again. I am telling you, these three things are going to come. And you might think maybe one thing or the other, but they're going to find a way to make sure they all happen at the same time. You're going to get sign-up fees to try to get more money off people and to try to fight churn and to dissuade people from churning so they just stay subscribed because they don't want to pay the sign-up fee again. A credit system where your monthly fee to the service isn't going to be an unlimited access to the service. It's going to be a credit system where every time you watch something, it's a certain number of credits. Okay, click on the next episode of Shogun. Great. This will cost you two credits. Confirm you want to get it? Yes, I spend the two credits. Great. You have 49 credits left. Want to stock up on some more before the end of the month? Oh, and by the way, the credits don't carry over. Um, and no then- rollover? <laughs> and, and, they're gonna have value bundles for credits where it's like yeah you get 200 more credits if you get the 999 bundle not the 299 <laughs> bundle oh, man. Uh, this, and then this, premium this content. Head. and then there will tr- then there'll be premium charging for premium content and i'm just telling you that that's what's coming Ooh. and rob there's a part of it there's a part of it that i understand because Back when we went to that one point about the pandemic hit, all these people signed up for streaming. They thought this was going to be, you know, the gift that keeps on giving forever. They realized, oh, wait, this model isn't profitable. We are spending more money than we are making. Yes. It took Netflix over 15 years to get to the part that they were making money. Disney is still not making money on Disney+. Plus. And they're figuring out that okay we got to figure out ways to get more money because listen we as an audience audiences let's let's be real i want a 400 million dollar state-of-the-art visual effects bona fide spectacle and i want to pay 50 cents a month for my streaming service i do i do that's right that that's how we all feel we really do but it, the economics don't really add up, and they're going to take advantage of this. And Rob, it just comes back to something we've been all, all, all so many of us, the people watching us, have been saying for so long. We might have had it better under cable, and, and really, we don't. We have better content today. We have a wider uh, options available to us for content today. We have a lot of great stuff. We we are enjoying some very very good things under this new model. But we are just starting, I think, to get a sense of how much it's actually going to cost us to have. Anyway, do you think I'm being paranoid? Do you think these are things that could actually happen? Are there other things I'm not even thinking about? How do you see this whole thing? Well, to quote Tom Sizemore in Catherine Bigelow's Strange Days, it's not whether you're paranoid, Lenny. It's whether you're paranoid enough. <laughs> and and I, I think you're not being paranoid at all. Uh, I think that what you just described is exactly what's going to happen. And, you know, I think the thing about the streaming services that people maybe don't grasp is that Hollywood studios never had a stable cash flow. They never knew. They put a movie out in theaters. They could, they could, they could market it to death, but they never knew how much money it was actually going to bring in. The streamers gave everybody, a, we, can, we have this many subscribers and this has how much money we're going to make every month. They never had that before. But now they realize, like you said, with churn, people come and they go. They didn't figure that into their percentages or whatever. They're like, why would people leave us? They didn't They didn't get that. And they're watching and they're spending $200 million on movies like Red Notice. That's gone. 
that 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 two hundred million dollars they spent is just poof disappeared into the ether. Why not make a movie like The Mother with J Lo and it's forty million dollars and you get the same amount of viewers and you still made no money from it other than whatever you were getting from them from a monthly subscription fee. So I think what you just laid out, and not only that, John, every year, every day, there's somebody who graduates from college that suddenly has to pay for their own apartment. And what do they do? They get Netflix. And when they introduce this new fee system, the people will be like, oh, okay, because they've never had to pay for it before. So they're going to say, well, this must be the way it always was. Mm. You're yeah, not well, even going to know that, what, well, sign up fee, $30? Absolutely. Yeah. I want Netflix. And Good. when Love is Blind season six shows up and I've only gone through seven of the 10 episodes, well, I've run out of credits. I got to know what happens. If Love is you Blind, get, are they going to work? Credits, is it going to work yeah. out or not? Yes. Get and I'm going to sign up. Go, go, sign me. I'll get more credits. Oh, guess. oh, and they can give you, instead of just getting like five credit, you can do like a 20 credit package. But also, you know, we missed the opportunity here on the utilities and Wendy's <laughs> Wendy system peak streaming hours. Oh yeah, that's oh, yeah. so more thing. credits for peak oh, streaming hours. Yep. Charge so you more during peak like, hours. And here's where they're yeah. really going to get you when something ex like an old piece of content explodes, like, like suits. suits. Well, guess what? People started binging that. It's nine fucking seasons. Yeah, that's the yellow credit. All of a sudden, you're paying three hundred bucks yeah. in a month yeah, yeah. just so you can it. watch Suits. I can yeah. see it now, right next to my physical Bank of America ATM. It's a Netflix <laughs> ATM where you get a card <laughs> or like Flix coin, like Bitcoin. Flix it's coin. Flix coin. What uh, digital? I, I, I well, I, they, they'll have. Do you read what Bitcoin was up to? Oh, I know. Wow. Yeah. They'll have to have like a FOMO uh, category. Like, but, you don't want to miss out. But these are like the eight okay. credit, uh, you know, tier. Dude, this is like. George Lucas's THX 1138. This is so dystopian. But I'll tell We're you all what. We're walking around in this. I need to start working for these streamers. They're about to make some cheddar, man. Oh, man. That's, I, okay, that's the that's the point here. <laughs> if, if this does come in fruition, um, the, the, the response from actual people who are paying this, like, what's going to happen? Because me, I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll go back to cable. Here's the problem. <laughs> It'll be gone. Cable's disappearing. Uh, yeah. Well, well, you know what? Because yeah, yeah, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Are you not going to watch Shogun? Are you not going to watch Stranger Things? Are you not going to watch House of the Dragon? Are you not going to watch Last of Us? Are you not going to watch Star Trek? Are you not going to watch well, you know not, the new yeah. the new Mandalorian? Are I'm, you not? That's the thing, right? Because those yeah. things aren't on cable. But everyone knows a fool who will be paying for this, and I know my fool. Dude, what, right I'm, I'm your fool. That is my official I'm job title. With I'm you, baby. Fool. Dude, I gotta tell you a funny story. This uh, so yesterday the Oscars are on, right? Were they? I, I, they were. Oh, man. And I realized that I don't have a service where I can watch the Oscars. Oh yeah, that'll come. No, I, you know I'm, I've got all these streaming services. Can't watch the Oscars. And I think to myself, wait a minute, I have an antenna. I never hooked up the antenna yep. to the TV. Free over the air stuff. And I'm there. like, yo, there it is. All the 50 Oscars. mile radius. And beautiful <laughs> 480p. I, 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 I felt like I was a, a, a like, uh, I felt like I was a, a Luddite from 25,000 years ago. Here I am, Rob Korg, 23,000 BC, hooking up his antenna. But it worked. <laughs> I, got, I watched the Oscars for free. <sighs> all right, listen, guys, we could, we could honestly, this is a topic we could talk about all day, but we're, we're going to have to move on. But the question is for you. What do you think? Do you are you one of these adorable people that you think this is as expensive as it gets? Do you, the, you do do you, are you one of these adorable people who don't actually <laughs> think the streamers are going to find ways to get more money for us and make it more difficult for us? Because what are our options? I'd love to, I listen and, and facetiousness aside, I'd love to hear your rationale. I honestly really would. Maybe it could change my mind. But anyway, whatever you guys think, jump down into the comment section below and leave your thoughts there. All right, guys, with that down, let's move on to this, shall we? It is now the second age, or the second weekend, at the box office for Dune 2, the best movie I've seen in probably over a decade. Uh, my wife, Anna, has now seen it four times in theaters. Uh, I've seen it three. <laughs> She's already bought our tickets for her fifth screen. <laughs> that's a lot of credits. Uh, that's a lot of credits. <laughs> that's a lot of credits before it comes to Max. And, you know, the big question last week was, it made $82.5 million in its opening weekend. Fabulous. But what will it do in its second? Will it fall in that range where you hope a movie falls between 50 and 60% drop? Will it have a worrying drop of an over 60% drop? Or would it be a fabulous second weekend of a less than 50% drop? Well, the numbers have come in, and it was 
the last thing. Dune Part 2 made $46 million in its second weekend, which represented only a 44.2% drop. And that's with Kung Fu Panda 4 opening making $58 million at the box office. And we'll talk about the Kung Fu Panda thing here in a bit. But the Dune Part 2 thing, you know, the only thing I was worried about, it's chances of making out because you know there's going to be a lot of repeat viewings there are going to be people are going to hearing all the buzz are going to go so i was figuring it probably make it would do better than less than 50 percent. but i was thinking 49 48 like 44.2 percent drop which is incredible so good for it 46 million dollars its second weekend is bigger than dune one's opening weekend so just put that into a little bit, and there's asterisks to that, absolutely, but just to put it a little bit in context. So, but my only other worry was, I didn't know if a lot of people would go see Kung Fu Panda, but it's a very family-friendly fr- film, and maybe some adults who would have gone to see Dune or maybe gone to see Dune a second time, they're going to like, nah, I'm going to bring the kiddos to the movies or something like that. And when I saw the numbers that Kung Fu Panda were racking up, I was like, okay, well, this isn't going to be good for Dune. Still only took a 44% drop, making $46 million dollars. Couldn't be better. Uh, so happy for it, and that's wonderful. <laughs> Is that but, a real mo- emoji? Did you it's real that? ones. Yeah. But let's talk <laughs> for a second, it. too, about the success of Kung Fu Panda 4. This is a f- franchise that is now 16 years old. It's been 16 years. Want to feel old? 16 years since Kung Fu Panda 1 came out, back in 2008, if, if I'm remembering that correctly. Yep, 2008. 2008. 16 years. No Kung Fu Panda movies ever like had a huge box, and I honestly didn't know. But Kung Fu Panda 4, after declining box offices for the Kung Fu Panda franchise, made the second most ever in its opening weekend. Take a look at this. Look at this image here. So the first Kung Fu Panda came out, and it made $60 million opening weekend. Fabulous. <clears throat> the second one came out, which is also terrific. The second Kung Fu Panda movie I think is terrific, but made less on its opening weekend than the previous one did, but still made $47.6 million. Then the third one came out. I admit, I'm not a huge fan of the third one, to be honest, but its opening weekend dropped even more to 41.2. Who would have thought the fourth one, years later, Long after what some people said was a franchise that was past its shelf life. While Dune 2 is in theaters and made $58.3 million. I Listen, I honestly can't remember the last time a franchise like this, which was showing decline, right? While it was still running, showing decline, decline, decline. And then all of a sudden a fourth one comes out and boom, almost as big of an opening weekend as the original uh, back in 2008. This is huge for them. And it just kind of boistered by the fact that the early reactions were very positive. The audience's reaction to the movie has been very positive. Word of mouth has been good and good for them. But the biggest winner is just the box office in general. Because yeah. just between Dune Part 2 and its second weekend and a 16-year-old franchise in Kung Fu Panda 4, they made well over $100 million at the box office this weekend. Yeah, plus everything else. Yeah, plus everything else. Imaginary, the cherry on top. Ten, you know. That. Bob Mara's One Love still hanging around in the top five, by the way, making another $4 million. But, I mean, this is great for both Doom Part Two and Kung Fu Panda 4. Rob, you saw the numbers. What are the things that stand out to you the most when you look at this? Well, if you're some, if you're a college student and, and you're 20 years old in 2008 and you and your friends go see Kung Fu Panda, now you're 36. You're married. Your kids are five, six, seven. They're ready to go. And you go and you go, hey, kids, there was a movie that came out. Because think about it. If, mm-hmm. if it's four years between each yep. movie, that's a generation of kids. Yep. That's the difference between four and eight. So you've got an <laughs> entire. Is, math. I, I know, right? That's an entire generation of children and parents that get to go share the awesomeness of Jack Black singing a Britney Spears song over the end credits together. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's good. I mean, I think, you know, hit hit me baby one more time with the Kung Fu Panda franchise and it worked out. And, you know, like you said, John, the most important thing is all these movies are making money. Yeah. You know, even Angel Studios that made Sound of Freedom has their movie Cabrini that came out that was in the top yeah, five. Yeah, made, made seven, six, seven million dollars. And, yep. and, and Jason Blumhouse, $10 million. For a not even very well-received movie, no, by a, the way. No, a movie that probably cost about that. Yep. 
So everybody won this weekend, including us, because we get great entertainment and your wife gets to see your favorite movie for the fifth time. By the way, it's it's officially replaced Big. Oh, no. Yep. She said she told me this weekend. She said Dune has officially replaced Big as her favorite. Does that mean you have to get another framed poster? She's dead to me. I oh yeah, I absolutely have to get her another one. We've already got a big we got in in our hallway leading to Anne's office in the house. She's got a big big poster and a big Dune poster. We might have to put up a second or third. Oh, actually she said Big has been dropped down to her number 3. <gasps> Cuz Dune won. Well, no, she considers Dune kind of one story. Okay. Guardians of the Galaxy. Oh, nice. Like wow. what, what she, she said, it would you always be well. behind Big, but once, she said, once the Christmas special came out and once Guardians 3 came out, as a collective, Guardians is now my second favorite thing. Dune is her favorite thing. Guardians are second. Big is now her third. But Tom <laughs> Hanks is still movies. her, <laughs> Tom Hanks is still her number one favorite human being in the world. I mean, above me. So, I mean, there, there's that, of course. Anyway, guys, <laughs> question is for you. <laughs> what do you think of these numbers? Dune 2 has a remarkable second weekend. Kung Fu Panda 4 has a terrific opening weekend. I mean, it all looks good. How do you think they're going to hold up? Whatever you guys think, jump down into the comments section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. With that down, we still got to talk about Super Mario 2 has officially been announced with a release date and probably the best Oscars I've seen in years happened last night. We're going to talk about that stuff and a few things more, but before we do, we're going to take a quick second and thank another sponsor of today's episode of the John Campus Show, our friends at Harry's. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of today's video, Harry's. You know, guys, in order to start the John Campia show, I had to leave my high paying corporate job in order to set myself up to be happier and enjoy more personal success. Because sometimes to get what you want, you have to challenge the status quo and blaze your own trail. And that's exactly what the folks at Harry's did. You see, at Harry's, they saw customers getting ripped off by questionable products in the shaving industry and decided to do something better. Harry's decided to pave their own road by making beautifully designed razors for a fraction of the price of the other big brands, except Exceptional products, honest prices. That's Harry's. I have fallen in love with Harry's from their foaming shaving gel that feels just luxurious on the skin to their incredible razor that feels just as good in the hand as it does going over your skin. They've got rich lathering skin softening body wash and scents like Redwood, Wylands and Stone. You see, Harry's provides German engineered blades made in their own factory that stays sharp longer. You can get a five blade razor, weighted handle, foaming shave gel and a travel cover for just three bucks at harrys.com slash campia. Don't settle for the status quo. Blaze your own trail with Harry's. Get started with a $13 trial set for just $3 at harrys.com slash campia. That's harrys.com slash campia for a $3 trial set. And thank you to our friends at Harry's for sponsoring today's episode of the John Campia Show podcast. Look how smooth my face is. All right, with that down, guys. It's like a butt. <laughs> Some on someone's butt. <laughs> Smooth as someone's butt. Every day. <laughs> this is my life, ladies and gentlemen. With that down, I keep you down. I keep you level. Let's move on to this, shall we? The number one biggest film of last year, of course, was Barbie. But the number two was this little movie that could. <laughs> Super Mario Brothers. Uh, broke the billion dollar barrier when not a lot of films are these days. Uh, Barbie obviously did, but Super Mario Brothers did as well. And it's kind of just been a countdown clock now. And when are they going to announce the second one? Well, that has now happened. This comes just from the folks over at Variety who wrote the following. Illumination and Nintendo will join forces to produce a new animated film based on the world of Super Mario Brothers. The companies previously partnered on last year's The Super Mario Brothers Movie, which grossed more than $1.3 billion and became the second highest grossing movie of 2023. It's unclear which fanciful characters the new film will focus on, be they plumbers, princesses, Koopas, or other residents of the Mushroom Kingdom. And the partners are not using the word sequel. However, the companies did specify that the movie will be released in theaters on April 3rd, 2026, in the U.S. So we are two years away from this. Like, they just announced it, and this movie's going to come out in two years, which, again, no duh. It made $1.3 billion. I mean, I remember... No duh. I, I remember <laughs> early on, I said, guys, look, you're not going to believe me, but I, I think Mario Brothers is going to be the biggest box office film of the year. Because, you know, when I'm seeing the reaction to the Mario Land and all that kind of stuff, now, of course, Barbie beat it, 
But even everybody who thought I was wrong never thought it was going to be Barbie. And you said that a year it. in advance. Yeah, but people, even the people who thought it would be wrong, and I was wrong, Barbie was the number one film of the year, but they never thought Barbie was going to be the film that beat it, right? I mean, who would have thought a year and a half ago that the two biggest films of 2023 would be Barbie and Super Mario Brothers, and they'd both be in the Billion Dollar Club? Not a lot of people, including me, if you wanted to add up both of them. So this comes along, we knew it was going to happen. Now, there's a lot of discussion going on right now that some people think that the next movie isn't even going to have Mario because again as Variety pointed out they didn't use the term sequel and the guy from Nintendo specifically said you know we're going to expand this world of Mario even more so some people interpreting that as being oh this is going to be a completely different movie and it's not going to involve Mario himself and it's going to be some other characters and you know all that kind of whatever and I, I get it I don't think that's what they're doing. Let me be clear. I have no insider information on this. I'm just I'm just speaking as a fan like anybody else. I'm just speaking as a fan. I could be right. I could be wrong. I don't see them doing that. Like, yeah, maybe if you've done three Mario movies and you want to start doing movies based on other characters, but you've only done one. And there is no other character you have that is anywhere near as popular as Mario. So... I think they will do what they said. They're going to expand the world. I think we're going to meet more characters. I think we're going to see more areas, more lands maybe that we've seen portrayed in in Nintendo and all that kind of stuff. I still think, though, at the end of the day, it's going to be Mario-centric. And maybe someday they'll move beyond that. But again, Rob, this is a a no-brainer. Of course you do a follow-up. But the question is, can it be as successful as the first one? And do you think the fact that they didn't use the word sequel and they say they're going to expand their world much. Do you think that maybe means the next movie isn't going to be Mario-centric? Do you think it will? I don't know. What do you think? Look, I think they have to make a sequel to Super Mario Brothers. I, 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 you've got your... It's like making a movie without your lead actor. You know, that doesn't... It's a hard thing to do. And they've tried that a couple times. Uh, and they have tried well. it a couple times. And here's the weird thing. In our AI world, they can digitize Chris uh, uh, Pratt's right. voice. You know, and and and... I think this is even kind of, it seems to me that this is a negotiating tactic. They haven't gone to him. They don't know quite what they're going to do. When you've made a movie that makes a billion dollars, your stars, agents, and people get a taste of that. I'm sure he made a chunk of change. But I think they're they're hedging their bets right now because they probably are thinking, well, if you're going to make a Mario universe, but what do you do? Mario's always Mario's been the star since Donkey Kong. Back in 1980, yep. I mean, you, you know, don't, don't not to take away from that big ape, but it was Mario trying to get up those hills. You know, I mean, that's your star. You've got to, you've got to lead with your star. I mean, dude, I could see a Talladega Nights meets Days of Thunder <laughs> with Mario, you know, and do a whole Super Mario Kart racing movie. That'd be dope. I'd watch that. A whole circuit. Uh, that yeah, there, it's a, a whole, whole thing. season of it. A whole yeah. se- I mean, I would watch that and, and imagine all the, the cameos for the other racers. They probably just don't know what they're going to do. They have so many opportunities or so much richness from that world. Now, I see. I could see how they would expand to other things like Luigi's Man- Haunted Mansion. Very popular game. Yep. Luigi is the secondary character to Mario. It would be very... I, I just don't think you do that. Yeah, I mean, look, Donkey Kong can have his own movie. Luigi's Haunted Mansion can have his own movie. I think there are a couple of other characters, but again, I think those are things you expand out to after you've done a couple of things with Mario there to anchor everything. Um, but again, we might be wrong. I, I mean, they very well could announce three months from now, or maybe they come out at CinemaCon and, and say, the next movie is oh, <laughs> Peter Pascal is Wario. <laughs> I could see it. But they're going to come out and say Donkey Kong coming in 2026. That's what the next... I mean, maybe they do. I, I'll i just be surprised if they do. I, I think you got to stick with Mario right now, and we'll see where they go with that. Question is for you guys. What do you think about this? They've announced, finally, they've made it official. The next movie's going to be coming out. It's only two years away till it hits theaters. Do you think they will remain Mario-centric like we kind of think they will? Or could it be the other option? Maybe they're going to do a Luigi's Haunted Mansion or a Kong movie or, or a Princess Peach solo movie. I don't know. Whatever you guys think, jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. With that down, let's move on to this, shall we? Last night was the Oscars. Now, I, I have said for a very long time the Oscars are my second favorite day of the year the only day of the year that is 
more favorite of mine is Christmas Day. Christmas is very special to me. But other than that, more than my birthday, more than anything else, Oscars Day is my favorite because I'm such a huge movie guy. I love the celebration of the Oscars. However, many times over the last number of years, I've come away from the Oscars while still loving the results and having some questions about some of the results, kind of disappointed with the show overall. And, and I usually, uh, some have been better than others, but I usually come out with a big long laundry list after the Oscars about what the Oscars needs to do to be better. You know, that's what I've done the last five, six, seven years. But I got to tell you, last night's Oscars, while I was a little bit nervous, you know, they had Jimmy Kimmel doing it. He, he's, you know, he's got experience doing it. I'm really more of a person that I believe a movie person should be hosting the Oscars. I've been saying that forever, all that kind of stuff. I'll tell you what, from the first opening montage they brought up. That was really good. Before Kimmel came out walking on stage, uh, highlighting the movies of the year and stuff like that. I thought, this feels good. Look, I'll just cut to the chase. This was the best Oscar broadcast in years. It was the first time in a long time that the Oscars ended. And results aside, I just went, I really enjoyed watching this. Um, I mean, I thought a couple of categories got really wrong, but th that aside, I thought overall the flow of the show was incredible, right? Um, oh, yeah. And this was Ann's favorite part, the uh, the tequila shot thing, uh, yeah. right? And she goes, oh, my God. I like, like, it was just like the whole tequila shot thing was great. When What's his sidekick's name? Guillermo? Guillermo. Not, Guillermo it is Guillermo. Yeah. See, Guillermo gets up and says, I love all these people and my beautiful wife, Charlize Theron. I just about died. Charlize Theron. Charlize Theron. I just about died when that happened. Now, there were a couple of hiccups. Um, I love Melissa McCarthy. I love Octavia Spencer. Their little bit fell on its face yeah, for me. Fun. I Terrible. love them. Love, 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 love them. But that part fell on its face. Al Pacino's, like, what? I think I'm reading Oppenheimer. What? Um, I, <laughs> I think I see Oppenheimer. I mean, at least he said Oppen. At least he said the name of the right movie. And okay, then he caught, least... he, I think he caught the room, and he's like, then he listed the producers on it. So then they ran the music. Yeah. They're like, oh shoot. I mean, at least he said the name of the right movie. That was a little bit weird. But I'll tell you what, I thought Kimmel did an amazing job hosting. I thought, um, I even didn't mind the stupid songs. And I hate the fact that they play the songs in the Oscars. They were really well shot. They were beautifully shot. Billie Eilish's, listen, I'll tell you what, when you, the right song won, obviously, I'm Just Ken, uh, I love that song. That but, performance was great. Okay, we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. But Billie Eilish's thing, when you really listen to the song, it's like, because what am I always talking about with song? I want to hear songs that are really, the DNA of the song is is connected is the movie itself and when she's on stage singing it my mind just automatically started thinking about the scenes in the movie you know when when barbie's getting emotional and crying and and, and feeling sad and, and that's playing and it's like this is actually kind of perfect this song for for the movie that it's in and billy alish's and her brother's second second Oscar. Oscar. she's like 22 yeah, and she's probably going to have more at this point. So the performance is great. I love the presentation. Let's talk for a second, just for a second, about the I'm Just Ken number. There was not a single part of that performance that wasn't perfection. The fact that they even started the number with him is still in his seat, but the cowboy hat down over and starts singing it from there. The fact that, I, I think some people didn't even catch the fact that the other Kens from the movie, including Simu Liu, came out on stage and were dancing with him as well. The fact that Slash Dude, came... that was the greatest thing I've ever seen. Did that Slash. not become like one of the greatest Oscar moments Oh my ever? God. I'm like, oh, of course he's there. Of course it's Slash. Well, who else would it be? Fantastic. Um, and then staying on the theme of, of Ryan Gosling, Ryan and uh, Emily Blunt presenting. When Emily Blunt's like, we got to quash this rivalry between our... Uh, Emily's saying between our movies, but... You know, when you look at award seasons so far, it hasn't been much of a rivalry. It's like, oh, that's okay. Because since, you know, Oppenheimer's been riding Barbie's coattails all summer and blah, blah. Like, it was, it was wonderful. I cannot wait to see these two together in Fall Guy. Oh, my God. I, I cannot wait to see that. But let me tell you what my favorite moment of the night was. John Cena. John <laughs> Cena, because... Not, not only... And by the way, thank God I watched it because I just watched Ricky Stanicki and that movie stinks. Um, which is really too Ricky's bad. Stinky. But they bring out Ricky Stinky is what it should have been called. But still, 
John Cena comes out, like, what are they doing here? They hadn't even mentioned the category. He just walks on stage and then just a moment of silence and then costumes. And then I I just died. I was like, of course this is for the costuming category. It's like costumes are important. <laughs> and he stand there. I thought that was, first of all, how gutsy is that of him to walk out on stage like that? Um, it's And then he's talking like with Kimmel. It's like, you know, like Kimmel says something like wrestling is fake or something, something to disparage wrestling. Right. And the look on his face, this, I, I was like, Ray was there. I was, I was laughing so hard at this. I thought it was, it was perfect for the category. It was great. And then I'm always saying, make the Oscar shorter, make the Oscar shorter. And then they did something this year that made it longer, which was for all the acting categories, they had last year's winner and four other previous winners come out do a little monologue about each of the loved it that the nominee loved it even though it took more time it was perfect it, it made just getting nominated a really truly important thing having an oscar winner on stage spouting platitudes about each one of the people being nominated i thought it was fantastic and every time the five legends would come out on stage I thought that worked incredibly well. The flow of the show was incredible. It never stopped. It never slowed down. It, the Melissa McCarthy bit, unfortunately, whatever. And again, I want to see her do more. They I, tried hard, though. They, they, they tried, tried to make hard. that work. But the the um, preparedness of the production, how everything went off without a hitch, how everything just flowed so perfectly. And by the time it was three hours, I was, wait, what? We're, we're down to the last two. They said, next best actress and best picture. I'm like, really? Really? We're, we're that fast through it? Um, so, you know what? We'll get to the results in a second. But Rob, just talking just basically about the show itself. I was, for the first time in forever, extremely pleased with the show. How did you feel about it? I'm with you. I mean, I think this was maybe the most important Oscars that has happened in years, if not decades. Totally agree. Because you, you're you coming out of the pandemic. You're coming out of a, of a movie season. Yeah, and you had the Barbenheimer thing. People like movies. And I think that there was, there's been an attitude brewing because of social media and things. I mean, everyone's been too... I don't know, there's a thought that Hollywood is over and people, this was a, ref, a return to form. It was highly entertaining. It also was reverent, but irreverent. Yep. It was both things. It, it struck a perfect tone. Um, and also it was a celebration. I thought that those five, when the, the uh, Best Sporting Actress was the first award given, right. when those five actresses, including Jamie Lee Curtis and Lupita Nyong'o, they all showed up. I was like, that's, this is classy. You know, you're, you're, these, all five of these women looked radiant. This is what people want from Hollywood. And you can be as cynical as you want. But you know what? Movies still have magic. And this show celebrated that. But at the same time, it took the piss. It could still be funny. Like that yeah. John Cena bit was hilarious. Yeah. I mean, it was hilarious. Oh, and how many shots did they take at Madam Webb? Oh my god! Guy, like two, uh, I mean, three. They they were pretty they were pretty savage on Madam Web. And I, I thought it struck the perfect tone. And you know what? At the end of the day, it celebrated the movies. We all love movies. Sometimes we need to be reminded. Movies are still the greatest form of entertainment. I think that we have. And this was a, a, a really worthwhile show. And a lot of people who deserve to win won. And some didn't. And, but, well, and some did. By the way, a couple other moments: Devito and Schwarzenegger. Mm -hmm. talking about how Batman killed them. And it's like, he's right there. And they cut to Michael Keaton <laughs> yeah. with his Dude, Batman stare. But how his stare, his stare was not like comedic. No, no, it was like. He, he went into character. He I looked thought like, he was going to go up I'm on stage and kill them. Guys. Yeah. I, that was wonderful. And I did love how the pairings were a not so subtle marketing ploy. Like Furiosa, Chris Hemsworth, and mm -hmm. Anya Taylor, Taylor Joy. Joy. But we've been talking about how they should do that, right? Like yeah. we talked, I remember a few months ago, about how maybe the Oscars should take a little cue from the Game Awards and not just become one giant commercial, but do a little bit more to not yeah. only are we celebrating the year that was, we're looking forward to the year of movies ahead. And so you brought out Ryan Gosling and Emily Blunt together for The Fall Guy. You brought out... Um, 
uh, you you just mentioned it, the Hemsworth Furiosa and, pair. You know, you know they they yeah. did that, and I thought that was great. By the way, Schwarzenegger's little thing, that son of a bitch. Like I just like I just wanted to die when he did that. I thought that was incredible. Um, <laughs> and and now, so let's talk about the results. All right, a few minor surprises actually at the awards last night. Um, you know, it looked like Oppenheimer was getting shut out for the first 45 minutes <laughs> of the show. It was like, but once we got into the more major, of course, Oppenheimer, the big winner of the night, winning seven Academy Awards, including Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor, Best Supporting Actor, uh, didn't win screenplay, but it won uh, cinematography uh, and, and one or two others. But anyway, it won seven awards. The next big winner, of course, was Poor Things, winning the biggest award they got was Best Actress for Emma Stone, which surprised some people. But what a wonderful speech she gave. Wonderful speech. And I love the fact that she came up with the back of her dress busted. She goes, it busted during the I'm just Ken. I'm just telling you, I don't care. You know, she she is wonderful. I mean, I, 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 she's yeah. like she's one of the most precious things we have in Hollywood right now. But then it won a number of other awards as well. Um, again, no big surprise. Killian Murphy won. No big surprise uh, that uh, Robert Downey Jr. won. No surprise that Divine uh, won. Again, it, the only one that was really close was going to be um, Emma and uh, uh, Lily Gladstone. I, yes, and Lily uh, for Best Actress. Of course, Lily just won the SAG, went to Emma this time around. And uh, but again, uh, totally deserving, 100% deserving. A couple surprises in the uh, screenplay thing. I, I'm American so, Fiction. So thrilled for American Fiction. So, so, What a so great thrilled. speech he gave, too. And it was a great speech. Talking great about, hey, guys, speech. instead of a... Take out one of your $200 million movies and make 10 $20 million movies. Now, of course, what a studio guy will say back, you, you can't do with $20 million what you could do 10 years ago. But still, I mean, there was something about that, and he was, like, so excited and whatever, and I'm so glad to see American Fiction win a major award because it was such a good film. The screenplay is so great. Um, but there were two I take issue with. And I'm not going to call them snubs, and I'm not going to call it whatever. It's just I'm just not happy with them, and that's fine. That's that's cool. That's what the Oscars are. The Boy and the Heron is a wonderful film. <laughs> it's wonderful. No no caveats. It's wonderful. It was not as good as Spider Man Across the Spider Verse. I know that's sacrilege because it's Miyazaki. You're supposed to say it, if it's Miyazaki, it's the greatest thing ever, and normally that's true. I have all the reverence in the world for Miyazaki, but. Spider-Man Across Spider-Verse was the better animated film that year. It should have won. It didn't. Okay, that's fine. Godzilla, minus one, won Best Visual Effects. Yes! Yeah, but here's the thing. It shouldn't have, and every, everybody knows it. The visual effects in Godzilla... Godzilla minus one is the better film than The Creator. It's a better movie than The Creator, but that's not what the award is supposed to be. And everybody knows the visual effects in the creator were better visual effects than the, what they had in Godzilla. Because if Godzilla minus one wasn't a good movie, but still had the same visual effects, nobody would say it should win best visual effects. Because it wasn't the best visual effects. The creator was. Better movie, but again, whatever. We're not, we're not everything you pick is going to be the one that wins, and that's okay. That's part of what makes the Oscars so great. So those are my only two nitpicks. Every other category... I was totally good with. I, I was even like thrilled for a couple of them. A couple of them a little bit surprised, but still thought the winners were great. Uh, as you look over the results, any surprises for you or, or ones that stood out to you? Only, only screenplay. You know, I was really happy to see American Fiction win that. Um, and that speech. I mean, I've been saying that. You know, I say that on the social media on the internet for years. That. You know, why don't studios make ten movies like that? When he, I was sitting there cheering him on. You know, and look. I was happy to see we've had Godzilla movies since 1954, you know, since the first one. This film took the Godzilla franchise up to a new level. And I did think if after watching that Toho reel, and I, I, I don't know if it did it, but their Toho reel that they put out, it's on, you can watch it on YouTube. It's six minutes long. Watching this team of 35 people... <laughs> The way it was done, I'm like, this is this is old school. I mean, now everyone's sitting at computers, and I think Godzilla did a perfect blend of old school effects technology and new digital technology. Especially considering the budget they had. Yeah, it was what, what they accomplished was remarkable. But like you pointed out, the creator is extraordinary because we're now in a world, they shot that movie, there were not 
uh, marks on the wall showing where uh, tracking marks and things like that. They could go shoot in Southeast Asia and get these beautiful live action plates. And then they can comp anything in the background now, no matter what. You can take live, it could be shaking. The, the, the effects technology they pioneered in the creator had never been done before. So I would say, yes, it's fantastic. But as a kid, you, I, I, I get listen. I get it. I get that people because it's the better movie, and the design of those shots was amazing. Yeah, and listen, I, I, I have no, I took no qualms that they that the visual effects branch of the Academy Awards gave a nomination to Godzilla. I had no issue with that. But then it, but then it's not the visual effects branch that votes on the winner, right? It's the whole Academy that votes on the winner. And I think, I, I honestly think it's just the fact that Godzilla minus one was such a crowd pleaser. It was the better movie overall than the creator sure. was. It was, and I understand that people were cheering for Godzilla because they love Godzilla. But I'm just asking people to be a little bit more objective. The visual effects in Crater were clearly superior, and it is what it is. But, but you, you know what? It won. And, I, and by the way, how great was it when Godzilla minus one won it? And all those people from Tokyo came out. They had their Godzilla statues. Yeah. Did you notice they were all wearing okay. Godzilla themed shoes? <laughs> All of them were wearing Godzilla-themed shoes. It was one of the coolest on-stage moments. They were like filming it. They had like their cameras out. <laughs> oh my God! It was just, it was just so charming and such a great Oscar. But I think I John, that was that sort of signified the entire broadcast. Yes, I, I thought 100%. for the very first time. You know, every everybody is so cynical about Hollywood and movies and people and celebrities and all that. This was finally a return to form. I felt like wow. The thing that we love so much, movies, the thing that we celebrate, what do you say every morning? Movies and TV news that we love yep. so much. This was finally a return. I love this show. Yeah. I felt like, I felt movies are back, baby. I, this, this thing that we've loved for our entire lives, why did we let it? Why did we not love it? This just reminded us how great movies can be. <laughs> I, I love the one joke. I, I think it was Kimmel who made the joke. But first of all, how how great did jody foster look last night oh like crazy good but anyway they first of all they brought up this really awesome fact they said 40 years ago tonight robert de niro and jody foster were both nominated for academy awards for taxi driver and then tonight they're both nominated again first of all that fact blew my mind but then kimmel made one of the best jokes of the night when he went now back then Jody was young enough to be Robert De Niro's daughter. And today she's twenty. She's twenty years too old to be his girlfriend. <laughs> and I, I, Ann and I both just cracked when he said when he said that today she's twenty years too old. Oh, oh, oh! And then the whole, who was it? It was was it America Ferrera that was up with the who's the girl from Saturday Night Live? That's oh. weird, Barbie. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah uh, uh, no, it was McKinnon. Kate, Kate, Kate McKinnon, McKinnon, right? Yeah. Kate McKinnon get up and they're like documentaries this 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 jurassic park yeah and then she's like oh yeah. it's not a documentary she goes, what are you talking about she's and and uh what's his name is real she goes then who have i been sending all my taste yeah they cut to? the hard and cut. spielberg i mean and i found i read afterwards that that wasn't scripted like spielberg just saw that he went back up on screen so he just went and like he just <laughs> rolled with it right but i mean like the it was just such a great job they did. And when's the last time we said that about an Oscar broadcast? Long enough, I can't even remember when we did. But full credit and kudos to those of you out there who produced the Oscars last night. You did a fucking great job. I, I, it, it, it has reignited in me. My, now I'm excited for the Oscars again next year. Um, and it's not because... They pick the right winners. No, because you put on a great presentation. Yeah. For the first time, I think this might be the first time ever that I thought the Oscar presentation, the Oscar broadcast, was better than the Golden Globe broadcast. Yeah. Golden Globes are meaningless, but they always put on great shows, and I actually think the Oscars outdid them this year. I also felt that the industry coming off, off of two strikes, everybody was, it felt like everybody was really supportive of one another. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, and and that was something that you could actually feel in yeah. this broadcast. You can especially see it when the I uh, I'm just Ken 
Oh, you know that that's where everyone's standing up, and then oh, yeah, Ryan Gosling even goes to Emma Stone, and she's singing the. She was her, singing it, yeah. You got those two have been in a lot of movies together too, but like even like IATSE might be going on strike. I again. know, and I thought that was really good. Right at the beginning, Jimmy Kimmel brought out all the behind scenes people, all the IATSE people yeah. come out. By the way, let's talk talk about this for a second. Um, the dedication, the homage they did to stunt performers. I thought was wonderful when they did they did think big thing about stunts. Now I know there's still a lot of people that believe they should have a stunt category at the Oscars, but when they were doing, I wonder what you think because you and I haven't talked about this. I want to know what you think when they were running the montage, the reel about why stunt work is so important and all that kind of stuff. It really drove home for me why you can't have a stunt category at the Oscars, and it's for two reasons. One. There's no other category where you would need the voters to actually be on set to see what's happening. And two, there is no way today that just a voter can look at a movie and tell what was CGI and what was a stunt. And it, it's just, I, that's why I, I'm not saying I don't believe stunt work doesn't deserve to have an Academy category. I think they should be honored every year. I think what they did last night, they should do every year. I think they year. should keep doing that. But I don't think you can make a legitimate category of it because it's just impossible to actually vote on. I don't know, Rob, how do you feel about I that? I agree 100% because, you know, you can only vote on what you have in the finished film. Right. And nowadays, you can't tell what stunts were done and how they were done because, like you just said, you're not on set. But what they did, like you said, Jonathan, they should do that every year. And make it, you know, make it some kind of an honorary or yearly thing. But now, I'm sorry, in the digital age, there's no way that a, a, a movie, when you're watching it, because you're awarded based on what the finished film is, yeah. not what it took to get there. Right. Not like, you the, know, the stunt coordination, the planning, the, the blocking it out. Like, how do you know? You don't know. And, and there's no way that anybody watching a movie could ever make that decision. So every year, I think they should start every year at the Oscars set aside a two and a half and listen you may say only two and a half minutes two and a half minutes is a big block at the oscars yeah set aside a two and a half minute homage reel to the best in stunt work that year and really honor the stunt community every year because i i just don't think you can do a category but they deserve to be at the annual event that celebrates movies you have to have a seat at the table for the stunt people who are such a big part of it and if they can do that every year i think that will make a lot of people happy um anyway guys we could talk about the oscars all day. Uh, it was just such an incredible night. And again, huge night for Oppenheimer. Uh, winning all the... Christopher Nolan finally winning his Best Director Academy Award. I mean, it's shock. I remember Anson. So how many does he have now? I'm like, C counting tonight? Yeah, one. <laughs> it's like finally getting his Best Director uh, Oscar and uh, being... So, I mean, yeah. So, like, Killers of the Flower Moon got shut out, I think. I think it was completely shut out. Uh, there were... I think Barbie got shut out other than the song category. That was fine because the the night put such a big spotlight on Killers of the Flower Moon and on Barbie and just getting all those nominations. Oh, and, and he, we didn't we didn't mention that, but live performance that that performance from Killers of the Flower Moon was really cool. Oh, that was really, cool. It was awesome. That that then when they started doing, it, I'm like, oh, tell me they're going to play this whole thing out, and they did. It's like I, I you know what it reminded me of? It reminded me of the um, uh, uh, the Indian film last year. Uh, oh, RRR. RRR, when they had the musical. First of all, I, I didn't like RRR. Oh, my God, that musical number last year was so good. It was so and good. I love that and one. And, you know, Robbie too. Robertson, who did the score for Killers yeah. of the Flower Moon, passed away. Yeah. Oh, he I was didn't in, know that. He was in the In Memoriam. He was in the, yeah, and I'll tell you something. I, I actually, he I did a public service announcement for the Oneida Nations because they contributed to the American Constitution, and he did the music for us. And he was an incredible person to work with. It was That's so awesome. amazing. It was it was he was awesome. I love the band and the last waltz. Oh God. yeah, and and you know Martin Scorsese goes all the way back to the last yeah. waltz. So yeah. it, that performance was beautiful. It was really beautiful. And then the and first first of all the in memoriam was incredible. You have the greatest singer in the and I mean this whole heart the greatest singer in the world up there saying Porti Voltaire and and like just which just killed it. I think that was his son. That was up there with him too. Anyway, uh, guys, question is for you. What did you think of the Oscars? This is the maybe the first time some of you have ever seen me be really happy with an Oscar broadcast. <laughs> I thought they killed it last night. How did you feel about it? Whatever you guys think, jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. 
With that down, we're now going to move over and start to the most important part of our show, which is taking your questions that you guys have sent in. Now, before we do, though, we're going to take a quick second and thank another sponsor of today's episode of the John Campia podcast, a new sponsor to us here, our friends over at Miracle Made. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of today's video, Miracle Made. Did you know that your temperature at night can have one of the greatest impacts on your sleep quality? If you wake up too hot or too cold, I highly recommend you check out Miracle Made's bed sheets. Inspired by NASA, Miracle Made uses silver infused fabrics and makes temperature regulating bedding so that you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. When they arrived at our house, my wife Anne loved to feel them so much, she couldn't even wait for me to get home to put them on our bed. Miracle Made has self cleaning. These sheets are infused with silver that prevents prevents up to 99.7 of bacterial growth, leaving them to stay cleaner and fresh three times longer than other sheets. Miracle sheets also have incredible comfort and quality. Miracle sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands and feel as nice, if not nicer, than sheets used by some five-star hotels. So go to TryMiracle, that's T-R-Y-M-I-R-A-C-L-E dot com slash Campia to try Miracle Made sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use our promo code CAMPIA at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you will get a full refund. So upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash CAMPIA and use the code CAMPIA to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash CAMPIA to treat yourself. And thank you to our friends at Miracle Made for sponsoring today's episode of the John Campia Show podcast. All right, guys, with that down, let's get to the important stuff, which is you guys. What do we got up here first, Jonathan? Uh, first up, we've got Damaris Love, who says, so with Godzilla minus one win, should studios learn how to work with a limited budget? Listen, I'm, I'm going to go back again to what I said before. Um, the what they did with the visual effects in that movie for the budget they had was remarkable it was not up to the visual effects standard of a 200 million dollar although there are some exceptions to that uh the other thing too is and remember i'm the guy since my movie blog days i've been on a one-man campaign saying that studios need to reel in the budgets on their movies they have to that being said it's a little easier for a, a japanese country to make a movie like that with talent who doesn't call for whatever amount of money to be in their budget. Like it's, it's, it's a little bit easier for a small Canadian production company to make a motion picture than it is, say, for a Hollywood company. But yes, I have been saying for two decades now that studios need to start reeling in how much they spend on the production of these movies. I do not believe an actor should be paid $20 million for three months' work. I, I Sorry, I just don't. I, I don't believe one actor... I was talking to a friend of mine who... You would recognize him if I mentioned. I was talking to a buddy of mine who's a director, and he was complaining about this one movie that he directed that the that the studios did, and the, they had this one guy on it, and the one guy's salary literally made up forty percent of the budget of the film. Hmm. That and and he as a director really liked this person. But it's like we couldn't do this, 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 or this because this guy got paid eighteen million dollars, and it's like they they need. And by the way, the main problem is not the actors or the actor salaries. But hey, you want to know why a lot of actors can barely pay bills? Because there's a couple of other actors in the exact same movie that are making 500 times what they are. That being said, um, from everything from above the line cost to below the line cost, yes, Hollywood needs to start figuring out how to not have to spend as much money. Because when you look at something like District 9, Rob, and you look at something like Godzilla Minus One, I'm not saying you can make an Avengers movie for $40 million. Obviously, you can't. But does it have to be $270 million? I don't think it does. I don't know. What do you think? There's an over-reliance on effects technology because it, it's a cure-all. You know, let's shoot everything against the green screen. We can make it work in post. That means every single shot in your movie is an effect shot, which exponentially creates more money that needs to be spent in post. And I, I think that it's, it's problematic. The one thing that Godzilla Minus One had going for it is that the director of the film comes from effects. You know, and, and when he was doing films back in the aughts like Returner or he did the space battleship Yamato live action film in 2010, he understood how effects technology is best employed at the budget level you're working at. But like you said, they don't have nearly the fees, or the, the, the money that's being paid that we have in the West. So 
they're able to keep that budget down. But really, it comes back down to nowadays, nobody even the 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 directors don't know anything about effects. It's like, okay, we're going to shoot in a green screen. They'll figure it out in post. I'll see it when it's done. So you have an entire industry that has been created around the fact that even your most basic shot of two people sitting at a cafe might be comped in afterwards. And, and that means know. that's hugely expensive. And why are you doing that? Uh, one other thing I should point out too is that, and this is what we as film fans, I, I include myself in this, that we are guilty of a lot. Yeah, we see Godzilla Minus One, which they made for $15 million. Say, see, see, make tons of money if you make a movie for $15 million. For every one Godzilla Minus One, there's 90 movies that got made for under $20 million that nobody ever heard of right. and never, yeah. never made any money at all. So like, yeah, we can look at Godzilla Minus One and say, see, but we can't then just go, and I've been guilty of this too, go say, well, that should become now the template, right? So you make a movie for $15 million, you'll make $75 million. For every one of those successes, there's about 90 of the failures. And so we just got to keep that in mind too. But there are object lessons to be taken from it for yeah. sure. All right, what's next? Got Michael Brocky who says, in my childhood and teen years, I idolized RDJ as Tony Stark. Now as I'm aiming into this industry, uh, I see him win an Oscar. A part of me feels complete. I would say... Go back and watch Chaplin then. I was, I was going to say it's actually really more of a full circle moment for Robert Downey Jr. Because he did not start as Tony Stark. And I get it. There's a lot of people. If you're under 30 right now, you probably just think of Robert Downey Jr. as Tony Stark. Because ever since you were in your teenage years, he was playing Tony Stark. But he started differently. He started as a... Um, respected actor. He started as a, you know, somebody with a lot of uh, awards feel right. He, Chaplin, he got his first Academy Award nomination for Chaplin. And unfortunately, he derailed himself. He derailed, he, he sabotaged his career with the problems that he had. And he's been able to do what a lot of people haven't been able to do, which is pull himself back up out of it. I love the analogy he gives with his wife. He said, I'm the stray dog. He said, she found me and she loved me back to life. I thought that was one of the most beautiful things. Plus, dude, oh. go back to one of my favorite B-movies. It does not get enough love. Oh, Tough here we go. Tough Turf. <laughs> Tough Turf from 1985. James directed Spader. by Children of the Corn director oh, Fritz Kirsch. Kim Richards, whose sister became one of the housewives of Beverly Hills. Robert Downey Jr., James Spader, and Olivia Barish, and Kim Richards. Yes. <laughs> All right. What's next? It was intense. Uh, Michael Brocky's back and says, I'd like to thank my ter terrible childhood. Oh, I, yeah. <laughs> RDJ 2024. <laughs> there, listen, in all the, there was some great exceptions. Roberts was great. Divine, what, her speech was fabulous. Uh, the, uh, the, the screenwriter for American Fiction, fabulous. Emma Stone's acceptance speech, fabulous. I mean, there was just a r lot of really, really good acceptance speeches. All right, what's next? Maximum Mustang or Maximum. Maximus Mustang. All right. Okay, John, hear me out. Timothy Chalamet <laughs> as Terry McGinnis and Keaton as old Bruce Wayne. And uh, the time could not be more perfect for Batman Beyond. Your thoughts. I think we know them. I think well, we Timothy, know them. Timothy Chalamet would never lower himself to do that. Oh, boy. Oh, man. Wow. That By the way, that that's a great idea. I'm right and, there with our viewers. And on top of that, like he's uh, Timothy Chalamet is going to have every offer thrown at him for you know Oscar-winning films. So, it, yeah. So that's not going to be a thing. Plus... Uh, Ray, just double check with for me here. How old's Timothy Chalamet? Okay, he's he he ain't, he ain't a teenager. Oh, yeah, but he it, well, like, we often twenty eight. He's almost thirty. Okay, so like we often refer to him as this kid's amazing, right? I know I use that terminology, but as Chris Carr reminded me yesterday, um, uh, Fisty McFucky, what's his name? <laughs> Terry McGinnis. Terry McGinnis. Bro. Terry McGinnis is, is supposed to be here? a high school student. And so let's say you did that. By the time they actually got around to being on set and shooting something, he'd literally be 30 years old. So can you uh, imagine the no. numbers he has in his phone? I can't even imagine. <laughs> I, I have can't. numbers in phone. By the way, I watched <laughs> Wonka again because it's it's now on. Uh, it's I think it's Max that it's on now. I watched Wonka again. My God, that is such a delightful. Did that movie, did that get to 700 million? I know yeah, it cracked 600 million. I think it might have. I can't remember how close it got to uh, it was seven. Over six. It was like six. I know it was over six. It, the Wonka got well over six hundred million dollars. I mean, six twenty five. Wow. Six twenty five. Okay, right. so it got over six hundred million. I, I mean, and he's so. It's just so weird watching him do Wonka, and then play 
Paul Atreides. I, I mean, if you want to know how good this guy is, but no. Listen, <laughs> you guys will be lucky if you get an animated film. And I think it's possible. I think it is possible there could be an animated film. But Another uh, animated film. Because um, there was one before. Did they do it? Oh, yeah, the, yeah. the, the, the Return of the Joker, yeah. right? Um, but, yeah. I, but, I mean, like a legit a, a Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse theatrical released movie, which they never had. I think there's a chance for that. Other than that, nope, 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 nope. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Sorry. I, I'm sorry, guys, but I've been saying this for like 12 years. And for 12 years, everybody's been telling me I'm dead wrong. Wait till you see, John, in the next year or two. They're gonna, and I keep saying, no, they're not. And here we are 12 years later. Nothing has changed. So, uh, but you, here's fine, what John. could change it's it. Fine. Here's what could change it. Collecting some receipts right now. <laughs> here's what could change it. I said... Into the Spider-Verse changed things a little bit because I think it made an animated Batman Beyond film possible. So here's what could change the live action thing. You make that Batman Beyond animated film and it becomes a smash hit, which it won't. But if it did, if it did, then even somebody as skeptical as me is going to have to go, you know what? They just proved that the audience is there. And if they make an animated film and it's a big hit, and I don't even mean a billion dollars. I mean like a $500 million hit, like big smash hit. And I think for that $500 million would classify as a big smash hit. Then that changes things, Rob. And then we can start talking about a live action. Until that happens, I don't see it being a possibility. You don't, you don't agree? I uh, love Batman disagree, Beyond. Disagree. I have my hot right toys. Now, I'm going to disagree. Rob's wondering how much he uh, enjoys this job uh, right uh, now. No, <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, in all, in, in all seriousness, I, I uh, look, anything can be great with great characters and a great story. Absolutely. And I do think that the Batman Beyond animated series was terrific. I like the movie, The Return of the Joker, and I think that they could make a great film out of it because it's the one Batman movie that you can go Blade Runner-esque. You know, you can actually bring back that Anton first production design like Tim Burton had and make it crazy. This, this only okay, but you're only, you guys are talking about what they could do. Right, right, right. What will a studio do? Will the studio make that without a hit animated feature first? I think it's been a long time since the series and it's been a long time. So I think they would have to try it, as you say. I, yeah. I but, but I think, I think if somebody wrote a great script, uh, you could really pull yeah. something like that off. It's not that. It's the DCU that James Gunn is coming out. If it starts catching on fire, they might just go into a Batman. It but would have to be an Elseworld. Here's, here's the thing. If, if, what, yeah. One of our beloved members in here, Robert Presser, was just saying, who's been a viewer for a long time, said, you're dead wrong, John. Really? You've been saying I'm dead wrong for over 12 years. I know. Where are we? Where, <laughs> where, don't where, argue no, with... No, no, wait, no, no I'm, I'm looking. Where, where for 12 years... Where's this Batman Beyond movie? Everybody's been telling me I'm wrong about that they're not going to make. Hmm? Nobody well, could argue with you. I, I mean, you you're right. You're right. Where and, is it? You're and, exactly and, right. And I'm saying now they could do one if they did an animated film first. You disagree with that? You think they're going to? You think after 12 years of not making it, you think they're just going to roll out a 125 million dollar budget and make a live action one without an animated feature first? I think you're crazy. The only reason why this heated up was that part in Batman, uh, the Batman, where he goes into the club with like contact lens and you saw that text shining through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the only part. When I saw that part, the first thing I thought about was, oh, Batman Beyond. This would be so cool. Like in this, in like with that sort of a theme or like um, just like a darker with like a Batman Beyond in it. I was like, oh, that would. <laughs> you know what it reminds me of? Huh. I know you've never seen Parks and Rec. Right. Uh, Jonathan, I can't remember if you've watched Parks and Rec. Oh, yeah. oh no, yeah. okay. not this thing. So there is an episode in Parks and Rec where there is this <laughs> no, <it's> society <laughs> that's kind of like a version of Scientology. It's not Scientology, but it's kind of like their own thing, where they believe in Gorb the Inferno or whatever the name of the guy is, is at some point going to come back and it's, there's going to be a night that comes that Gorb the, the Devourer is going to come and destroy the world. And every year, this society gets together and has this big party in the park celebrating the return of Gorb. And of course, every year, Gorb never comes. That's what this Batman Beyond conversation is. I'm Ron Swanson running around selling free wooden flutes to everybody because all these people believe every... No, no, no. Definitely, definitely this year it's happening. 
I think but, people, but the one thing really? that we have is we have an animated series that proves the co the concept works that nobody watched and it, it only lasted three. <laughs> stop, seasons. Rob! Just stop! Just stop! All I'm saying is, right? Like there was it, it went off air because nobody watched it. You know why people get that's it? That's why it hasn't been continued. That's it, listen, studios are greedy. well, they made a movie. Studios are greedy, right? <laughs> they're greedy. If they think something will make them money, they're gonna make the hell out of it. You know why they haven't made anything more with Batman Begins? Because they don't believe it's going to make them any money. Now, <laughs> again, again, I think Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse became a proof of concept that I think Warner Brothers can look at and say, you know what, if they can do that with Miles Morales, with their Spider-Man thing, maybe we can do the same thing Terry McGinnis? Yeah. Okay, oh, maybe finally. we can do the same thing McFisty. with Terry Mc, with Mc, with McFisty. Maybe we can do the same thing with McFisty. He has Pukey, the name. Pukey has McFisty. The name. That's it. That's who it was. Pukey McFisty. Maybe they can do the same thing with that. But, oh, someone but yeah. until that happens and until that movie becomes a big hit, don't 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 worry about wasting your time thinking about a live action because it ain't gonna it's happen. It's just that you're crushing people's dreams right now. Some I'm not. I, I'm just telling you reality. <laughs> that's 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 why For people over a are decade, like I've get so hot over reality because everything you always say there's it's possible it's possible but this one you're like nope nope never gonna have it that's why people get so upset I, 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 I i'm just saying for 12 years people have been telling me i'm wrong yeah, and you've been and right here we still you've are been right so you if christopher nolan went into warner brothers tomorrow and said i want to make a batman beyond movie they would <laughs> yes they would <laughs> they would do it so now tell me the odds that christopher nolan's going to walk into warner brothers and say, zero you want to do a batman zero. Zero. Yeah, zero. Zero. but it could happen it could happen in some all if we're living in a simulation some people believe we are. We might be five levels or ten levels down from base reality. <laughs> Somebody might Man. rewrite the world and say, it. Tomorrow. I don't want it anymore. Sure. Tomorrow. I don't want it. No, I Can want I just it say anymore. that Maximum Mustang really got his money's worth on this one? <laughs> All right, let's keep going. What's <laughs> I don't next? Want it anymore. Uh, Jay Loco, moving right along. <laughs> MCU Iron Man kill count. Iron Man 1, uh, 41 Terrace. Uh, I don't know these numbers. Iron Man 2. Oh, Iron Man 2, zero humans. Iron Man 3, 12 people. Age of Ultron, 33 with the Hulk. Uh, Infinity Saga, <laughs> shit done. A Thanos crew. Uh, P.S. Congratulations last night to RDJ. Oh, yeah. Listen, like, so we, we were talking the other day about, you know, uh, would Batman kill and the Batman actual kill count in all the movies. All the movies Batman kills. He, they like again mr sunday movies has a great video called the batman kill count right or the batman body count that goes all the way back to the michael keaton batman movies all through the christopher nolan batman movies and how many many times batman has canceled the subscription to life of many individuals in those movies um but it's true like just all the superheroes do iron man kills a lot of people captain america has killed a lot of people they they just all do and not, not that they go out looking to murder anybody but Hey, it's sometimes in the process to stop evil. You might have to do something. I to just want to somebody. point out that Robert Downey Jr. killed himself in the movie Less Than Zero oh, back in 1987. Just saying. Just saying. I, that you know, that out turning there. more. Tune into <laughs> Robert right. By the way, he's, a, he's great in that movie. Yeah. And just again, a quick reminder to everybody who's on the other side of it. Batman has absolutely killed in the comics. Absolutely has. 100%. All right. What's next? Sam Fisher, I don't know if this is a hot take or not, but How Do You Live is a better title than The Boy and the Heron. Uh, it's just a more interesting and dynamic title. But The Boy and the Heron is much more in line with the with the titling stuff out of uh, the whole Miyazaki camp, yeah. right? When you really look at how they title, that is a very, very Miyazaki title. So, and a, and a Studio Ghibli kind of title. It, it's, yeah, you can come up with something else, but that one fits the brand more, I, I think. Anyway, all right, what's next? Uh, we got, uh, J yeah, Jamal Turney who says, John, what was the worst, uh, the worst of uh, the Disney remakes to you? For me, it has to be Lion. They screwed the songs and removed the most important scene with Rafiki and Simba. I do give Favreau credit for Jungle Book. I 100% disagree. I actually, th I don't care what anybody else says. I think the Lion King remake was wonderful. It was not as good as the original. It, it, it wasn't. But I thought it was wonderful. I remember me and Aaron Cummings went to go see it. And we were both practically in tears at certain points in the movie. I, I, I don't care what anybody else says. The movie's fantastic. It's the highest grossing animated film of all time. Join the Billion Dollar Club. 
all that kind of stuff. Not as good as the original. For me, I think it's Maleficent 2. Um, hmm. I, the, the Beauty and the Beast remake wasn't great, but it had its upside. Um, but both Maleficent movies, but particularly Maleficent 2, to, to me, were just swings and misses. I still think the best one they ever did might have been Kenneth Branagh's Cinderella. Uh, the um, oh, like Aladdin the original one, was, one. Which one? That was the first one. Yeah. Wasn't Cinderella well, was the first? The first no, I think... They they did one or two before that, I think. Mm. But I, I thought that was really good. I thought Aladdin was really delightful. Deli Here's the thing to me, Rob. Aladdin is really, to me, the template of what their live-action remake should be, which is staying true to the spirit of the original animated, but also making it its own thing. And, like, the Aladdin live-action remake that Guy Ritchie directed, which I, th I thought he did a killer job on that, was very true to the original Aladdin, but... At its own, it was it had its own identity at the same yeah. time, and they did something real special. What would you say is maybe the weakest of the live action ones they've done? In terms of remakes, yeah, that's a tough one. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I would say, I don't have something off the top of my head. M Maleficent, though, I don't. I agree with you, but that's not a direct remake. You know, I I think for the that's most true. part, yeah, that's a good. Yeah, point. I think for the, the most part, they've done a pretty great job. Like, look, you and I both. I can't think of one I think is terrible. I don't think any one of them has been terrible. They've all had something I thought was respectable about them. Mm. Like, look, I thought it was a, a mistake to remake any of them. And I went and saw Cinderella. And I thought, like, why would I go see Cinderella? I was dragged to it. I'm like, ugh. When I saw it, I'm like, this is a wonderful movie. And now I there, think... I was going to say, a couple of people just point out the Pinocchio one with Tom Hanks was not very good. Oh, um, oh yeah, did they? Oh, that's Robert Zemeckis too. Yeah, and Mulan. I I I still you know think what? Mulan was a little bit better than Maleficent too, but Mulan wasn't wasn't great. I always forget about Pinocchio because it wasn't theatrically released. Right, right. Oh yeah, I went straight to Disney but, Plus. So I I would the, hands down it was Pinocchio, and it was even more <laughs> yeah. it was even more disappointing that it was Robert Zemeckis yeah. doing it. Yeah. Okay. There you go, Pinocchio. <laughs> All right. What's next? All right. Sam Fisher says, okay, I think I'm ready for Kimmel to retire as Oscar host. Unless there's a year where Matt Damon is nominated, then bring Kimmel back for feud hijinks. Did you guys see the post credit scene where they had the, the dog? dog peeing on Matt Damon's yeah. star? The dog from, uh, um, not Zone of Interest. Uh, follow. No, uh, Anatomy, Anatomy of a Fall. Fall. No, no, the dog yeah. from Anatomy of a Fall peeing on the Matt Damon star on the Walk of Fame. He knew it was coming. Oh, it, it, it was great. Listen, I'll tell you what. When they announced Jimmy Kimmel, I thought, Okay, it's it's a, it's a safe it's a safe pick, and maybe they kind of need. And his opening pick. monologue was very safe. And I prefer a movie for all that kind of stuff. I honestly thought Kimmel was great. I, I, I great really too. did. I thought Kimmel was really really great. Um, I, I, I again, I just I'm just so impressed and shocked how much I liked the Oscar broadcast last night. So you know what? At this point. I, again, I prefer a movie personality to host the biggest night in the movies. But they announce Kimmel comes back again next year. I'll be I'll, I'll be fine with it. I'll be fine with it. And who's going to take that gig too? There's a lot of people who want don't want that. No, Oscars because gig. like w after what people did to say like Kevin Hart, because remember they announced that Kevin Hart right. was going to host the the Oscars, and then all of a sudden a whole bunch of people decided to dig to up. go dig through yeah. twenty years of social media point posts and find something objectionable and then whatever. So it's like I think a lot of people at that point said, you know what, I don't want to be a target. I don't want to be a target for that. So I, I can get why a lot of people wouldn't even want the job. But uh, I thought Kimmel did really good. That you gotta you gotta find someone with a sensibility like um, Billy Crystal, who's also in in the industry if you're going to go in in industry with that. well i mean billy crystal was like the ultimate oscar yeah. host i mean he was yeah. just great by the way too somebody just mentioned in the live chat how good was that john mulaney bit oh yeah <laughs> that john mulaney feel bit was dreams. feel the dream really good win. feel the dream yeah. although they'll probably really give it to good. one that came out this year is it weird that today whenever john mulaney speaks all i hear is spider pig <laughs> uh, yeah, that's kind of weird. <laughs> yeah. Peter Porker. That's yeah. all. That's all I hear. <laughs> because there's such a small part. I know, but that's all I hear. But he now. owned it. I guess yeah, he he did own that role. Somebody in live chat is saying John Mulaney hosting next year. He'll never do it. You know why? Yeah. He's got too much stuff in his closet that he wouldn't yeah. want people to complain which is, about. Which sucks. You know what I yeah. mean? It's kind of like we we ruin uh, opportunities to actually find a new great host. Yeah, we do. We really do.
All right. Anyway, what's next? Uh, what is next? I think it's Matan here. Early 2025 Oscars predictions. Another hype sequel versus Return of a Master battle like Spider Verse versus Boy and the Heron with Dune versus Megalopolis. And Mulaney will call out the animation is for kids mentality as host. I think a lot of people are getting ahead of themselves with Megalopolis. I am too. I'm a little worried about it. I, yeah, listen, you, you are talking about one of the all-time greats, but who has not done this in a very, 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 very long time. Um, and He sold this vineyard to pay for it. I, I, he did. That doesn't mean he's going to do any I'm good. I'm afraid it's going to be a Ridley Scott effect. Yeah. Is what I'm feeling. I, again, Guys. I haven't seen the thing. I haven't seen the thing for. I'm not saying I'm not hopeful. I'm just saying I think people are acting like Francis Ford Coppola has spent the last ten years making great films. He hasn't. No. And so I, I'm just. I'm not saying be doubtful. I'm not saying that at all. It's Francis Ford Coppola. I'm just saying let's not get ahead of ourselves uh, because I. It is my number one most eagerly awaited movie now that we've for seen for good reason. Too. Yeah, I but I bet you're not saying I'm betting it's going to be the number one best film of the year. No, yeah, and and maybe it will be, maybe it will be, but we're going to have to see it first. I think. All right, what's next? Uh, um, Amin with a two parter says, "What a show! One of the best, great winners overall. Some surprises, but all deserving, in my opinion. Love the way they presented the acting awards." And then he goes on to say, "I've never really teared up during the show, but last night I did it on a few occasions." I think they need to bring back the acting clips, though. You can't have the ledges come out and do full acting clips. Right. I mean, it's it's just it's just a time thing that disrupts the flow. I think you got to do one or the other. And I'll tell you what, I I had question marks because they said they were going to do this, and I had question marks about whether it would flow. It flowed. It it felt like you said, Rob. It, it felt like it was bringing the the prestige of the event, the mm -hmm. honor of the event, the eventness of the event. Plus, you, you can show clips from a movie that people have seen already, but when you show more Hollywood yeah. royalty looking royal, yeah, I mean, it was amazing. I mean, we got to see Lupita Nyong'o in an incredible dress. I mean, that, she looked that amazing. makes the Oscars worth um, it right but, there. But and also, you, you saw the heartfelt nature of how these actors respected one another, and I thought that was wonderful. I, I thought it was uplifting. I thought it was exciting. I thought it 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 brings a luster back to Hollywood. Yeah. The Hollywood needs. By you know, the way, I, I'd say a lot like how a good cop can sometimes get you to say thank you after they give you a ticket. <laughs> it, it, it literally made it. It took the sting out of not winning. If you were, because yeah. you got that yes. honor. You, you got yes. that honor. Yes, 100%. And by the way, in the best actress category, when Michelle Yeoh, who of course was last year's winner, was the main presenter for, uh, we were looking at her. It's like, what the. That lady does not miss Jim Day because you did you see her last night? Yeah, because she's starring in Star Trek Section Thirty One now. Oh, yeah. Her Dude, shoulder, her the the buffness and the definition in her arms, and I'm like, why do you don't mess with Michelle Yeoh? Not that you ever would, but you really don't mess with Michelle Yeoh. She looked like she could squash you. She's amazing. She looked amazing. I mean, let's let's remember in 1997 she was a Bond girl yep. in Tomorrow Never Dies. Yep. All right, what's next? Uh, from River to Sea, best Oscars in years indeed. Thoughts on Jonathan Glazer's brave acceptance speech? Uh, PS, 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 PS. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm freezing on the names. That was that's Jonathan uh, Glazer from right. Zone of Interest. Yeah. Oh, from Zone of Interest. It was a good speech. I'm trying to remember which speech it was. He was coming out, uh, for humanity and the end of certain hostilities. Oh, okay. Mm. Um, why am I... I was did I run to the bathroom though? I I don't remember it. Well, because I remember like the the twenty days in Mariupol. His speech was awesome. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah that was. Where he was like, like, I actually wish I didn't make this movie. I had to make this. Yeah, movie. that was a great line. I like unlike everybody in here. I really wish I didn't make this movie. Yeah. That, that, that I yeah, wish I didn't uh, need to. Yeah, that, that was hit right there. That was powerful. All right, what's next? Cinema, another year. Uh, yeah, Cinema, another year, another belittling of animation at the Oscars and treating it like it's only for children. I didn't think it yeah. was as egregious as before. I thought it was meant as a little joke, and I, I thought it was fine. Somebody who has been very sensitive in the past when they just treated the animation thing like some throwaway. By the way, the very fact that they created the best animation category was so they could treat it like a throwaway thing. I've, I, I have often thought they should just get rid of the category. The only reason they have that category is so that they don't have to worry about nominating animated films for best picture, because they can say, oh, look, it's got its own category. 
The creation of that category was not meant to honor animation. It was meant to keep animation in its place. And that's why I, I kind of take issue with it. But as far as the way they've treated animation before, I didn't think last night was all that egregious. Did you, Rob? No, I didn't. And I, I agree with you. They did that for that reason. But I also think animation is a different discipline. You know, it's it's sure it, it it's delivered in the same way that a movie is delivered. But in terms of how it's made, it couldn't be more different. Mm. All right. What's next? We got Christopher uh, Hobgood who says, "Today is my birthday. Happy I, birthday! Happy birthday! I was 18 when I started following you, and now I'm 28. Wow! How, how time flies. Do you think Furiosa will live up to Fury Road greatness? I well, do. okay. So one of the things that we as film fans do, and I include myself in this, that drives me crazy, is like if a new crime movie is coming out, and we the first thing we ask is, will it be as good as The Godfather? Why is that the standard? So if it's not as good as The Godfather, it's not good. Listen, Fury Road." is a beloved movie. And I think it's unfair and unrealistic to start off the discussion by saying, is it gonna be as good as Fury Road? It doesn't have to be as good as Fury Road. Even to be awesome, it doesn't have to be as good as Fury Road. So like the only thing I hope is that it's great. And it can be great without being as good as Fury Road. Now it's got a few things going for it. Obviously the same guy who made Fury Road is making this. Yep. George Miller's behind it, so there's that. I got to say, I think the trailer is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, but do you have it in you to make it epic? It's such a great line in that trailer. Um, so, yeah, it, of course it could be better. It could be five times better than Fury Road. But it, I think the important thing, Rob, is that it doesn't need to be. I, I don't know. Where's your expectation level? Uh, like my expectation Furiosa? for Furiosa is number two now with a bullet of movies I can't wait to see this year. And, and George Miller, to me, Fury Road and let's go back to 1980 two when it was released in the united states 81 if it was australia but the road warrior remains over 40 years later one of the benchmarks of action cinema mm. and he directed both of them and i would say you know and, and i'm a big fan of his i mean he produced happy feet and then directed happy feet too he made things like uh uh, the Witches of Eastwick, a movie called Lorenzo's Oil, which is a wonderful film. Oh, that's that's one that one Academy Awards did it. Not I think it did, or was nominated. I think he's a phenomenal filmmaker. Yeah, but I think now he's eighty plus. That doesn't mean anything because now we're, we're watching Ridley Scott movies. We're watching Martin Scorsese movies. We've got Francis Coppola coming out with Megalopolis. I I cannot wait to I, see this film. Yeah, if I, nothing else, it's going to be very special. Yeah, I hope it's great because I want to see it one in IMAX and then I want to kick back in a Dolby Cinema for the second viewing. Oh, one best screenplay, mm. Lawrence's oil, and best actor Susan Sarandon. I, 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 yeah, I knew it won a couple. Yeah, um, and I have to tell you, dude, uh, F uh, Fury Road was my birthday movie because it came out on my birthday, May fifteenth. You know, and I, this movie's coming out May twenty fourth, so it's a little, it's a little later, but it's like George Miller makes movies just to honor me. Right. <laughs> oh no, no, I was just going to say that That's we had a does. question the other day <laughs> about movies with good pacing. Um. I think Fury Road is one. Oh of them. yeah, yeah, beautifully placed movie. Incredibly. Oh, what a lovely day! <laughs> All right, what's next? Uh, mean is back. Who says? Um, well, let's get him on screen. Also, the Academy really needs to stop bringing those old legends to announce Best Picture. I mean, come on, get someone who can actually read. Oh, he can read. Oh. He was trying to be funny, and I, I it just didn't yeah, deliver. Yeah, the, the. I mean, look, it's such a big moment. Too. Al Pacino comes on stage. Yeah, you, there's a scene in in, uh, in West Wing. That says, I don't know where you're from, but in this house, when the president stands, everybody stands. When Al Pacino walks on stage, you get out of your seat and you stand. And I think most people did last night. And I thought it was great that you had Al Pacino coming out to announce Best Picture. I thought that was great, but that that was rough. By the way, shout out to that West Wing clip you just mentioned. <laughs> That's a great, <laughs> that great clip. That is a clip. great clip. But, I mean, it... Or at least just make sure you go through the rehearsal or something. And I, I look, but then again, if you're just some producer of the Oscars and you go, hey, Mr. Pacino, can we run through a rehearsal for this? And Pacino goes, why do I need to rehearse this? What are you going to say to Al Pacino? Yeah, Plus, Al Pacino's nothing. in his 80s. But he's still one of the great actors uh, in the is, world. He is, but like, people forget. I mean, he walks out there in front of all those people with all the lights and stuff, you know. it's He's not on set. Yeah. <laughs> He's tired. He's 82 with a newborn. <laughs> yeah, he's I, I just well, think, he certainly gets some jobs just done. Just make sure to do oh, at Lord. least one walkthrough with them so you know everything. Yeah. So he's, uh, am I reading Oppenheimer? I, yeah, it, was, it was awkward. But you know what? You know what? It wasn't Warren Beatty reading the wrong name. 
Yeah, he got right? it right. It, it wasn't that. And like I said, he read the room, saw he kind of like people were confused. And then he started announcing the producers yeah. to be like, this is who it is. All right. What's next? Um, we got Brendan who says, uh, never gave two squirts of urine about the Oscars, but last night had me emotional love Killian since 02's 28 Days Later, plus two goats, RDJ and Nolan. By the way, did you hear that they're, they're saying that Killian is going to be involved with the new 28 Years Later? Oh, good. Yeah. Good. Good. Uh, which I think is going to get a lot of people excited. Listen, he has been such a staple in the movie industry for so long. It's really good. Look, I would have been totally fine if they had read Paul Giamatti's name or a more outside shot, Jeffrey Wright's name. I would have been totally happy. I would have been totally content with that. That would have been perfectly good. Both of them totally deserving. But seeing Killian get that, that award last year, I mean, he's always been the bridesmaid in Hollywood. You ever, you ever notice that? Like, it's, yeah. he's always that other guy and now he's for at least this week he's the guy by the way that was a cool i love that joke that jimmy kimmel made you know he's he's killian or then he's cillian oh yeah he's in a romantic comedy (laughs) yeah yeah, i thought that was pretty funny (laughs) whatever he said it was funny all right what's next we got chubbs who says my brother's son is so great season two canceled yeah i'm really speaking michelle yo but look the reality nobody watched it um, I didn't even know it was coming until Ann said this new show just dropped. That's like, part. Of, that's Netflix's uh, uh, a big mantra. Achilles heel. That's let's put Achilles out heel. good shows that no one knows is coming. Yeah, <laughs> what the I, hell? I, I just and Brother's Son. And you know what? Even though it's not going to get a season two, it's a complete story. Brother's Son season one is is totally complete. I so don't think. Oh, I guess there's no point in going to watch it if they're not doing. It. No, no, no. It's still totally worth watching. It's really good. Go check it out, and hopefully maybe somebody else will pick it up. All right, what's next? We got Raymond Verrata who says, you always said the SAG winner is good pre- a good predictor for the Oscar winner. And normally it I, is. Yeah, I guess that's why Emma looks so stunned. At the end, there was text explaining that the guilds nominate, but the whole Academy votes. Yep. I mean, I mean that's the – we've been talking about that for a couple of years, right? That the individual branches, so the actor's branch, the writer's branch, the, uh, the director's branch, the music branch, the visual effects branch, like the individual branches are the ones that come up with the nominees for their category. But then once you get past that, it's the whole – once you got your nominees, it's the whole academy that votes. Now, Emma had won several of the major awards this year, as did Lily. She won several as well. I just and, and honestly, it looked like all the momentum was going to Emma Stone until SAG. Then Lily won SAG one, which brought it all into question. That's why I said that one was going to be a coin toss. But I believe all the other SAG winners did win. Robert Downey Jr. won the SAG, won the Oscar. Divine won the SAG, won the Oscar. Silly Murphy won the SAG, won the Oscar. Um, but yeah, it, it, we all knew that the Best Actress won was the one category this year that was truly a coin flip. And, um, yeah, I, I think maybe Emma Stone thought with SAG going that way, maybe this wasn't going to be her year and whatever, but I, she won, and honestly, I think deservedly won. I, Lily Gladstone in Killers of Flower Moon is incredible. I would have had no issues if she won. If I were an Oscar voter, I probably would have cast my ballot for Emma Stone this year because um, her it might have been the best performance of her career in Good Things. It's just... Or poor things, I should say. Yeah. Just so, so good. And she was right. the main lead in that, too. The main thing. She was always on the screen. Right? Yeah, I mean, she was the main person. In Have that. you ever seen the clip from the Graham Norton show where she explains how she had to make a PowerPoint presentation for her parents explaining no. how she wanted to be an actress? No. no. It's hilarious. Who did? Emma Stone. Oh. I, I, and I, I've always wanted whenever, because I love Emma Stone, all, all the way back to things like Easy A. She's so good. And I've always wanted to see her parents interviewed. Like, I was thinking last night, I wish they had her parents on deck going, so how's that PowerPoint presentation working out for your daughter? <laughs> well done, parents. Well done, indeed. All right, what's next? Seth Castro says, uh, hello, John and crew. It's my first time writing in. I've been watching you since I was a kid. I love the Oscars last night. I wanted to ask... Uh, did Al Pacino mess up uh, by not mentioning the other Best Picture nominees? By the way, I'm thrilled that Killian won. Sorry uh, if this was posted twice. I My guess is he didn't screw that up. Uh, because remember, they had spent the whole night naming one by one yes. each of the thing. Now, they could have still said, and the nominees are blah, 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 but they spent the whole night doing it. So I don't know this is a fact, but I am guessing that was not a... Al Pacino mess up. I, I think he was supposed to just go, and the winner is. 
because they're I don't know, Rob. Do you what do you think? I, I I would agree with you because they were showing. They made it a point from the beginning of the show to show those those packages, yeah, the those clip clips. packages from the best yeah picture nominees, and so it probably just said that because you know it, it would have been redundant and had although, he said it. But and although he's one of the greatest actors, like you never know how it, it's going to feel when you're up there and everyone's right there. You know, maybe it was just case of nerves. I well, don't know. he he's been on the Oscar stage, right? Right, but. <laughs> But I don't think that's something you get used to, is it? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, maybe. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. he Between red carpets and premieres and... Hua. And, yeah, hua. Like, I, I think of... But I don't know, maybe... You know public appearance-wise, he hasn't been... What was the last movie? Let me ask. Irishman. Oh, it was, okay. Yeah, which was... Uh, which, uh, again, nominated for a lot of Oscars. Anyway, all right, what's next? Chubbs uh, says uh, that uh, they always made fun of how they didn't see John Cena... Well, they sure saw him now. Almost everything there is to see. Real good acting in a live crowd. I thought... I mean, yeah. I thought when Kimmel first turned around and seen as behind the thing, right? I thought they were going to do they can't see me joke. But maybe the Hollywood crowd wouldn't have got the joke. Yeah. So I, at first I thought, oh, okay, this is... What's, what's Cena doing? When they actually executed the gag, and, I, and then they revealed when he says costumes mm -hmm. i just thought god this is one of the most perfect thing the oscars have ever done like just one of the and who would have thought 15 years ago okay 15 years ago that if somebody said do you know 15 years from now these two wrestlers dwayne the rock johnson and john cena the bah, 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 bah guy yeah they're both going to be presenters at the oscars <laughs> like who, who would have thought that I, I i don't know but i thought that moment was showmanship priceless i thought that was one of my favorite oscar moments ever that john cena gag all right what's next renetta says what a classy show some ups some downs but other than that fun john mulaney was hilarious that last joke by kimmel funny as hell also i was so happy for cord jefferson winning best adapted screenplay yeah well deserved uh again you know what every year there are going to be results that you agree with and there's results that you disagree with that that's going to happen uh every single year it doesn't matter what right and i'm sure there are a couple of, but and there were a few hiccups the most mccarthy octavia spencer thing the al pacino thing but my goodness it for a three hour live broadcast if the only things to go wrong were those couple of things then you've done a remarkably good job and i, and I thought they put together a remarkably Good job. I also just want to, I wanted to bring this picture up because I, I, I love this picture. Um, this was, I remember when I brought up that I said that I just realized that this, I'm going to be the first person ever in history to interview the two Gwen Stacy's together. <laughs> and it, this was when I was talking to them uh, for the help. And you can clearly see that Emma Stone is incredibly attracted to me. All, all, just the face says it all. I had to let the poor girl down that I was spoken for. Hard moment, but yeah, that uh, that was <laughs> Ray chuckling in the background. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, one of the truly great CinemaCon moments for me was standing, getting to sit there and talk with uh, Emma Stone and Bryce Dallas Howard. By the way, CinemaCon coming up, one month away. I need to ask something. Did, is is Anne gonna get? I'm sorry, this is I'm so off. So is Anne gonna get this Dune in art figure? Have you? Oh, I don't know dude. what you're talking about. There's so oh, in yeah. art, which is like the Koenigsegg of action figures. They are putting out a it, the the pre order has gone up for the Paul Atreides Dune this figure. Thing it is incredible. you can either get it with rooted hair or sculpted hair. I have to tell you, John. I'll message her myself. It uh, is some, the greatest. Well, give it to Jonathan so we can see this on screen. I it's haven't seen it. It's one of the uh, in art Paul oh, Atreides. Yeah. Just I N A R T. I have to say, John. It's one of the greatest action figure sculpts oh. of any face. Is it a six scale? Yes. Yeah, they it's do six scale insane. stuff? It's insane. I think I'll the, give it to him. We could go. It's amazing. Go on, it's amazing. Amazing. All right. And it's $500. Okay. What's next? All right. Uh, let's see. I got to find us. We did that one and we did Seth, right? Okay. Carlos says Spielberg handing Nolan his first Oscar was poetic. It it was amazing. And I remember even the shot with them then walking backstage as they were doing the cutaway outro stuff. And the, the two of them walking, talking like you, we, we're looking at two of the all like the greatest of all time in Spielberg and the and the director that some people consider to be the best director right now. I, I 
I think it might be Denis Villeneuve, but it's definitely Christopher and, Nolan. And you Denis know Villeneuve. Nolan's a Spielberg fanboy. Oh, he is. You a huge know Spielberg he's a Spielberg. Fanboy. He must love that. There is nothing more. I, like there, seriously, nothing could have been more perfect for, for Christopher Nolan than to one win his first directing Oscar and two to be handed it, have it handed to him by Steven Spielberg. I mean, what a yeah, moment! That, that dude could retire right now and be happy. Hundred percent, he could. Oh, here's the uh, image. There, I'll zoom in. That's a sculpt. Yep. Holy shit, that looks good, dude. How much is it? Insane. I think six hundred fifty bucks. How much is it? <laughs> well, um, that's like that order from six hundred fifty. No, if you go to the in art store, there's two different versions so of it. I think it's like. Four fifty or something. Oh, okay. There's a legendary edition. That's why it's. Yeah, I was about you, to say I might have to get it for dude, Andy, it's six fifty. Holy it's crap! That looks gorgeous. Real. That looks so good. Un I I love sand. <laughs> yeah. Oh, look at that. It comes yeah, with a thumper, a, a worm oh, thumper. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, it's gr it looks dude. It, you got to get the full. Have on. him riding the the AMC popcorn bucket. <laughs> be By perfect. the way, uh, Ray, you should just send Ann this and make her pester John for days. No, no, I, I'm about to right now. I'm about to oh, go like, hey. Okay. But you, I, I'm going to be honest. If they released a Wonka of the same quality, I would probably buy the Wonka. The Wonka one looked really good. By the way, too. that company is making a Henry Cavill Superman. Oh, Ryan got. Ryan I got really it like my Henry Cavill. Ryan, Superman. Superman. It's, it, uh, Ryan got that get one. To see it in person. Anyway. I'll, I'll see it. All right. What's next? Okay. Um, Carlos is back and says, uh, uh, "Over oh, right here, the divine speech moved me. It felt the most genuine." Yeah, I mean it, it, that was one. I mean, you can sit there and say, well, you won all these other awards. You probably should have known that you're just going to listen. Oscars history has shown that that's not true, that just because you won some other awards does not mean you're going to win that one. And when you're somebody like her, like maybe there's a part of you who's thinking like, oh, yeah, but when it comes to the Oscars, they're not going to give it to me. And like she was so clearly genuinely moved. And the story she told about it, too. Uh, about her getting started and acting, all that kind of stuff was so powerful and so moving. Absolutely loved it. So just just one of many great, 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 very unique speeches last night. All right, what's next? Uh, Amin says Blunt and Gosling joking about Barbenheimer was amazing, oh. and the stunt video really just proved they need the category. Everyone is asking for it. Doesn't matter. Everybody can ask for it all they want. You can't do it. There, there's just no way you. There's no practical way you can execute it because. Nobody, none of the voters will know how to vote. We know what they're going to do. They're going to vote for it the way they voted for Godzilla minus one. We have no idea if it was actually the best visual effects, but we like that movie the most. So we're just going to vote for that. Or just best action in a film. And yeah, it, that, it's, it's going to turn into a best action thing because, again, Academy voters are going to have no idea what was a stunt, what wasn't a stunt. And then they're also going to have no idea with today's technology, was that actually a stunt or was that cgi there's just no way to actually create a category around it and have and have it be a legitimate category there's just no way to do it i want to reiterate on how good the show was last night is that usually i have a routine in the morning like i watch the monologue and that's it this uh, today i watched several parts of the show that i remembered and really liked uh so it just shows you how good at least i thought yeah oh, and you were you there like with revisited. us watching the whole show last night too yeah yeah, yeah. yeah you were revisiting all yeah, right revisiting what's next one, two, five, three, sir, three writes, uh, I've heard Dune has to make 500 million in order to break even. Should I be worried about it bombing at the box office or not taking well, a big profit? After nine days, I think it's at 370 million or something mm, like yeah, that. Pushing four, let me so. actually, let me, let me pull this up. So at box office mojo, the movie's been in theaters for nine days. And let me see if I can bring this up weekend of july 21st or no that's the wrong it's playing one. in china too I'll tell you something i got one more showing in me right now like i think i want to see it one more time but like in dolby probably we'll see oh, I'll see. now okay now no Jose, now i got so dune part two which has been in theaters for nine days has made 367 million dollars it's it's going to be profitable <laughs> yes yeah, yeah. now again i've said all along it's not going to be a billion dollar film I, i've said from the beginning this is not going to be a billion dollar film but don't you worry it's Definitely going to be profitable. And five, I, 500 million might be right. That might be right. Because what was the budget on it? About 200 million? It was like two, 190. I thought it, was I thought it was like 250. No, it was less than 200. Oh, it was? Um, they were so then you figure they, I think they did about 100 million marketing campaign on it. Mm. 500 is close. 190. 190 to make it. Yeah. So you're probably talking 475, 
475 to 500 million after theaters cut and everything. You're probably talking about that. So that could be right. But yeah, it's it's going to be profitable. Don't don't worry about it. After 9 days, it's already made 360 something million. So they'll be fine. And it's it, it's got pretty much an open field for the next <laughs> month. Yeah. I, as a matter of fact, I think even though Kung Fu Panda was number one at the box office this weekend, I actually think Dune will leapfrog it again next week. It might, it might not. I, I'm just guessing. But it probably the tremors will. are coming. The Godzilla. It also it's has called. a long playability. Yeah, it's got Godzilla in coming. IMAX theaters too. That's true. All right. What's next? Bro, All right. On to our member questions. Uh, the real future millionaire says, "No question, but I have to say this was the first Oscars I've watched in years, and it did not disappoint." See, the thing that's funny is that we're getting a lot of these. We're film fans, and our audience is film fans, so. The fact that they were saying they're they're saying this right has a lot to say to the Oscars. Yeah, hundred percent it does. Like I I, I just <sighs> this is their market. So many things right. Watching. So many things right. I can't wait to see what the viewership numbers were uh, because the Emmy numbers were up, the Grammy numbers were up. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what people the Oscar were engaged numbers. by movies this past yeah. year. Yeah, and had movies they were rooting for. All right, what's next? All right, uh, we got uh, what is that? Nineteen Revenge. Uh, hey, John and crew, I was shocked to see the Godzilla uh, one over the creator, especially considering how captivating the visuals uh, in the creator were. I, again, I, I would just say that if Godzilla one minus one wasn't a great movie, but had the exact same visual effects, nobody would be saying it should win best visual effects. Everybody's just saying that because they love the movie. The visual effects in the creator, which is not as good of a movie as Godzilla minus one, but were clearly better. I mean, they were they were 100% global world class visual effects, also made for a fairly mod modest budget. But Godzilla minus one was the more fan favorite movie. It was, in my opinion, Godzilla minus one was the better movie. But it didn't. I'm sorry, it did not have better better visual effects than, um, than the creator did. It was a better movie, but it didn't have as good visual effects. Uh, Anyway, but I know everybody's very happy that Godzilla won an Academy Award. That's great. <laughs> Look at the other nominees in that Guardians Three, too. That was yep. that looked great too. Yeah, I mean, it was very was like, artistic. It had a lot of uh, I just, but whatever. The you baby know. raccoon. And it's Come fine. On. It's fine. The babies. The baby raccoon. All right, what's next? Uh, Sam Fisher says I didn't know this, but RDJ is the first SNL cast member to win an Oscar. Billie Eilish is the youngest two-time Oscar winner. He was terrible on SNL too. He did like one season. Yeah, it he wasn't admit, good. Admitted it himself. He was a regular. He was a cast member. He was a yeah. cast really? member for I, one. I didn't wow. know that. for one season. He must have been on the back end of the credits. It was like, like the tree. mid. It was like the mid '80s. I think it was also one of the same years that uh, Anthony Michael Hall was on. Yeah, and they both admitted yeah. like we were terrible on it. They hardly yeah. used us. Yeah. Wow, I, I learned something new. Every They're day. not sketch comics. Just no. shows that there was a lot of years gap that I didn't watch that night live. <laughs> All right, what's there's next? a reason. Yeah, uh, Damaris Love says with his first Oscar win, will Robert Down Downey Jr. be a building phase, or is he already doing that for his legacy? Well, he's built it. This is his legacy. I, uh, you know, build what? Yeah, no, Robert Downey Jr.'s. He, at this point, he's just adding to his legacy yeah. at this point. I, yeah, I mean, he's, yeah, he is who he is. I mean, yes, winning an Academy Award is a huge thing for him to put on the dossier that wasn't there before. Absolutely. But I would say that even, if, let's say he didn't win last night. Let's say Paul Giamatti won last night. I'd say Robert Downey Jr.'s entry into the Hollywood Hall of Fame was already secure. Yeah. Oh, I, I look at a movie secure. like Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Yeah, Shane Black's Kiss Kiss Bang. Between <laughs> big movies, small movies, like it, he's had Academy Award nominations. I, again, he's great, but I, I think now being able to say Academy Award winner Robert Downey Jr. You know, all I could think of when he walked on stage was the end of Tropic Thunder when his character walks on stage to accept the Academy <laughs> Award. I just that's all I only could think about. I still need to watch that. Oh, You've I've never seen funny. Tropic Thunder? No. Nope. Oh, you know, I've been itching lately to rewatch it. Uh, maybe this is a good time, Rob or Ray. We should set up a night where you come over. Only we'll order some. Uh, I do have it on 4K disc. There you go. That's the way I want to see it. There you go. <laughs> Just All right, saying. What's next. <laughs> what the hell? All right, Majoric <laughs> says, "Can we appreciate that Emma Stone fr uh, from Superbad is a two-time Oscar winner? I love her and everything." Here's the thing. I think Superbad was the first thing I've seen her in. Yeah, me too. Superbad. I first met Emma Stone on set of her and Rain Wilson's movie, The Rocker, because I was an extra in that. As this was back when I was doing the movie blog and whenever they were shooting something in Canada, I would get these little invites to go and be an extra in them if, if I wanted to. 
and it was so weird because at that time, Emma Stone was like totally charming, like so, But she was very much a teenage girl. Right. I mean, like she had this enthusiasm, and she was she was dating the lead guy for the rocker. Because you had Rain Wilson, and then you had Emma Stone, and I can't remember the name of the guy who played her boyfriend, but she was dating the guy. Josh? No, 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 that's not. Him. Now Sorry. you're going to say Josh Hartnett? No, 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 definitely no, no, was no, Josh no. Hartnett. No, no, but, no. Um, <laughs> but the, the she, she had a tendency in her younger years. It seemed like there were like four or five movies in a row that she would start dating the her co-star in those movies and stuff like that. <laughs> but she had this wild, like you could even just see being around set when the cameras weren't whirling. She was this wildly free-spirited, super charming, uh, charisma for days individual. So you could see why all of her co-stars would fall in love with her. There's so many th got, uh, people in this movie. Josh, I know, but whoever, who's at the top Josh of the Gad, call sheet? Jeff Garland. <laughs> yeah, yeah I forgot. Yeah, Josh Gad was in that too. Bradley Cooper. Uh, but I, I'm Aziz, saying, but who's the top Demetri line? Martin. No, but who's the top line person in the it, credits? It, well, it's Rain Wilson, Josh Gad, and Jeff Garland. That's so what, Josh Gad's not the one I'm thinking Vegas, of. Will Arnett. Anyway, uh, let's move on. Last question of the day. What's next? Okay. Red One Real Talk says, my mother always warned me not to swear like a sailor, and boy, did Shogun prove her right. <laughs> if only I had a delicious voice to deliver foul language with. I'll tell you what. There is so much that is utter perfection about Shogun. I mean, my like this is how good Shogun is. Every week now is just a countdown. Normally, it's a countdown to the weekend. It's not now. It's a countdown to Tuesdays. My life right now is about counting down to the next Tuesday so the next episode of Shogun can drop. Uh, this show just crushes it on every single level. If you have not started watching this show, you are making poor life choices. Um, and they're only three episodes in. They're even today, Monday, there is time to get caught up. How many up episodes? I don't even know how many episodes it is. I believe it's 10. It, it is 10. Okay. Which I is, believe it's going to be 10 think, episodes. I think, if I'm doing the math right, 20 credits. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to buy more credits. Yeah. To get to the end. Oh, it's Teddy Geiger. Is that the guy? Yeah. Okay, I never would have remembered his name. I can't believe I just searched Emma Stone dating history. <laughs> it's in there now. <laughs> no, it's on your, your, your search in your search now. now. Forever. Uh, yeah. I should have opened up Incognito. All right, guys. <laughs> and that'll do it for today's installment of the John Campy Show podcast. It's been a long one. Thank you so much for being here and making today's show part of your That's day. Big special said. thank you to all of you guys who sent in questions. Number one, because you gave us fun things to talk about. But number two, you supported this channel as you did it. And all of us involved with the show, thank you guys so very much for your support. I uh, just want to let you know there's going to be an open mic a little bit later this afternoon. So come on back and join us for open mic. That'll be about 4.15 p.m. Los Angeles time today. So if you just feel like coming by and just casually chatting about stuff, come on by and join us, shall you? All right. I want to thank the people in the room with me. Ray Ora. Exclusive, baby. Jonathan Boyko. Hey, see you guys later. Writer, director, producer, Robert Meyer Burnett. Furiosa. My name's John Campion. Thanks a lot for being here, guys. And until next time, my friends, bye-bye.